All right, here we go. Today we have Robert O'Neill, the Navy SEAL who killed Osama bin Laden, the architect of the September 11th attacks, which is the deadliest terrorist attack in history on U.S. soil that killed 3,000 people. Thank you for your service. I appreciate having me, Vlad. Thank you. I'm glad we uh, made this work, and uh, thank you for that. Yeah, absolutely. It's your first time. I want to start at the very beginning. So born and raised in Montana. Butte, Montana, yes. Okay. And uh, how'd you grow up? Both parents, single parent? Uh, my parents got divorced at an early age, but because of the size of Butte, Montana, they've always lived within a mile of each other. And regardless of um, how they got along, they always made it seem like they got along to us, so that was cool. So uh, it was like, it started off with, uh, I lived with my mom weekends with dad, and then when I got into high school, I moved in with my dad because he was a college basketball player, and I wanted to play basketball in college too, so we we lived together for the whole time. He's been my basically my best friend ever since. Okay, so... In high school, junior high, were you a relatively good kid, or did you get in trouble, get arrested? Well, no, I was I was good, I think. Um, the only issue is my mom was actually my math teacher in junior high and high school. <laughs> so when I, I have a tendency to, to tell stories and try to make fun and keep light, I think that if if people are happy, they'll work harder. So I'm the, the guy telling jokes. So, But the thing is, if I told the joke in my mom's class and she got pissed, she was still pissed at home. So that's that's the only trouble I got into. And I was, I was relatively good. Now, in terms of your family, were they military people at all? No, or no, the there was one? no. Uh, my grandfather, on my dad's side, was in the Navy in World War II, but uh, there was, it was it wasn't a big military family. It was I was never going to join the military. That wasn't even an option. We enjoyed war movies and stuff like that, like we'd watch Hamburger Hill, uh, mm. Heartbreak Ridge, and and uh, Full Metal Jacket and all that stuff. But it was never, n- n- no, never me. I was never, I was never a tough guy. Okay, well, in high school, you get dumped by a girl. Yep. And that actually made no, I, you I, uh, uh, college. I because I college. did. I did make it to play college basketball. Okay. Which w- Montana Tech, which is good for a uh, six foot white guy. So it's still <laughs> still pretty good. Uh, and I got dumped uh, during the season. I was like, you know what? It, it is, and it's 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 a common thing where, um, and I've been all over the country at an early age, and I've seen people say that I just got to get out of here. It's just time to get out. It doesn't matter if it's in Butte, Montana, Fredericksburg, Virginia, San Diego. People always say, I just got to get out of here. That was my, I just got to get out of here moment. And the easiest way to leave Butte, Montana was to join the Marine Corps. Uh, that's it. Okay. Well, you went to go join the Marine Corps, yeah. but you ended up joining the Navy. Yes. Okay. Which is also very common. People go to join the Army, end up in the Air Force. Aha. Uh-huh. And that's and that's just one of those things where if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plan. Because something else is going to happen. The only right. time the perfect plan exists is when you're planning. And, but what's cool about this, though, is I, I've told my kids about like the butterfly effect. If that Marine recruiter was not at Arby's that Wednesday morning at 1130, you wouldn't be alive hmm. because I would have joined the Marine Corps. But he was out to literally out to lunch. I'm in a hurry. And the only reason I went to see the Navy guy was because two guys I grew up with, Ben and, and Jim, uh, always wanted to be Marines, and as soon as they graduated two years ahead of me in high school, they went to the Marine Corps together. But when they came back, they told me a joke that said, uh, the Marine Corps is actually part of the Department of the Navy. It's just a men's department. And so I, that's funny. And I went in, I went into the Navy guy, because if anyone will know where he is, he will, right? Because, right, so I said, hey, where's the Navy, where's the Marine? And the recruiter, sharp dude, and he's wearing uh, anchors and khakis, which means he's the Navy chief, which chiefs run the Navy, clever. And he said, well, why do you want to, I said, I want to be a sniper. You know, a hunter, Marines have the best snipers in the world. He said, look no further, we have snipers in the Navy. Just, you got to be a SEAL first, but sign right here, no big deal. Hmm. And I was only smart enough to get in writing that I would be a, allowed a chance to get into SEAL training. In, and, that, and that was a good, I learned that from an Army buddy that uh, joined like two years before me, wanted to be a Ranger, never got to Ranger school because he didn't get in his contract. And he told me, uh, just whatever it is, get it in writing. And that's I've stuck with that since uh, day one. Just get it in writing. Right. Well, so you had a plan to become a Navy SEAL, but you didn't actually know how to swim very well. No, I did know how to swim. Which I, is one of the core requirements yeah. for being a well, Navy SEAL. Well, when I was talking to the uh, recruiter, I'm standing there kind of naive, 19 years old. I'm like, this guy's a professional recruiter. Why is he going to lie to me? And uh, I, I didn't think it was a big deal. Um and I could keep myself alive, but I didn't know how to how to how to swim. And he struggled. I even I still had my ID from Montana Tech because I joined in what's called the delayed entry program, and it took about five months from joining to leaving. So I I could go up with my ID and use their pool. And I, I went in there one day to I'll just teach me how how to swim. Standing in front of this pool, seriously looking like okay, it's 25 meters down, it's 25 meters back. I'll swim a thousand meters and then I'll gauge it from there. And uh, 
everything was going fine with my plan until I entered the water, and that's when the problem started. And I realized that uh, I just joined the Navy. I can't swim. This is bad. And just me being lucky, uh, my, my wife calls me the luckiest unlucky man in the world. Like the way she says it is, I could trip over my own dick, but I'll land in a pot of gold, like that kind of thing. Um, my buddy Mike Driscoll showed up, and he was a, he was um, going to swim at Notre Dame, and I know him really well. He's still a good friend of mine now. And he saw me, and he goes, "Look, don't take this the wrong way, but we've l- literally never seen you in the pool before. What gives?" And I said, oh, "I just joined the Navy. I'm going to be a SEAL." And he goes, "Oh, not like that. You're not." And then he got in the pool and taught me how to swim the side stroke and the breast stroke, and then I just practiced that every day. Okay. So you join the Navy. How long after you join do you actually go for SEAL training? Um, I joined, so I left in uh, 1996, January, for boot camp, Great Lakes, Illinois. <clears throat> From there, I went to a two-week A school. And in the Navy, an A school is your job, your specialty, which was two weeks in Millington, Tennessee. And then I went right to uh, Coronado for basic underwater demolition SEAL training. So I went pretty much right through it just because I got that contract that I was guaranteed a chance to qualify in boot camp. I passed, and then I went to Coronado for SEAL training. Okay, now SEAL training is insane. Yes. They say, what, one out of five makes it? Um, I think it's about 80% don't make it. Yeah, exactly. And what's 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 cool about it is uh, they can't figure out the system. It's 80% of everybody. 80% of the white guys don't make it. The black guys don't make it. The Asians don't make it. 80% don't make it. The other 20% do. And uh, they've, they've, they've run studies. They've tried to figure out what makes a better SEAL. Other than lowering the standards, they just they can't figure it out. And I, I just think it's I think it's because of the people skills, because of the instructors that are there, because hmm. they've all been through it. So you're being trained and destroyed and beaten by dudes who have been trained, destroyed and beaten also. So it's a and it's a I mean, I even had uh, I had an instructor. They don't need it's a weird mentality because you think these instructors are just gods. When you seal instructors are way worse than boot camp. It's like these are the guys. That, but I had an instructor say, the reason um, I'm so hard on you is because I'm going to be working with you when you get to SEAL Team 2, and I don't want a piece of shit. Mm. It's like, that's legit? Um, yeah, so, but it's, yeah, it's, it's a really hard course. Right, so you're going through it, and out of every five people that you're with, four of them are dropping out. Mm-hmm. So you're seeing your, your fellow recruits just yes. day after day, drop out, drop yes. out, drop and out. That's, that's where the mindset comes in, because they say that SEAL training is... Uh, mostly mental, which is true, but it's very physical. So yeah. the, the mentality is, uh, it's not just, oh, this sucks, I quit. It's, I'm tired of running on broken toes. I'm tired of these shin splints. I'm sick of having uh, sprained ankles and a, whatever, I just quit. Uh, but if you can talk yourself through it, that's, that's where the mindset comes in. And that, that also is applicable to, if you, see, if you see someone, and it's usually a loud mouth that you think is tougher than you and he quits, I've seen it all the time. A lot of people say, well, if he can't make it, I can't make it, so I'll just quit too as opposed to saying, bullshit, fuck him, he's out, I'm staying. Yeah, I remember I took a trip to Israel right after college, and it was a group of, like, students or people who just graduated. One of the guys on our trip was a Navy SEAL. And I just remember how physically he was just different than everyone else. He never got cold. He always wore shorts, even when it was unbelievably cold (laughs) outside. Um you know, and he was telling us stories about some of the guys he was with. He said a lot of them were like nuts. Like one of them had pentagrams tattooed on his hands. Uh, and like... Yeah, I, I'm not buying that. <laughs> no? no, okay. Well, that's what he was telling me. No, but he was just telling me like everyone was just very different than a typical. There was something different about every Navy SEAL physically. Yeah, someone that talks like that, I'd question whether or not he was telling the truth. Okay, fair enough. I was in there for 17 years. I've, I have, I've never, okay. I haven't, I haven't seen the pentagram stuff in this, <laughs> and the people that dabble in that sort of stuff, they either end up quitting or dying. Okay. So you, again. <laughs> I'm not trying to get all religious on you, but no, there's, nothing, no, hey, there's nothing wrong with praying to everybody. <laughs> okay, so you eventually become a Navy yeah. SEAL. I made it, yeah, I made it through the first time with Class 208 in 1996, and then I was assigned to SEAL Team 2 on the, uh, on the East Coast. And the way it works, um, I'm a big believer in, I learned this in the SEAL teams, uh, keep it simple. Uh, don't talk yourself into an ass whooping. Just mm. say, when you're done saying what you're saying, stop saying it type shit. Um, so the SEAL teams are, odd numbers are in Coronado, one three five seven even numbers of Virginia Beach two four eight ten, so I went to SEAL Team two on the East Coast. Got it. Now you also went to sniper school. Yeah, I Was went. That part of the SEAL training or uh, no? That it's still not those. Are, once you get through with the training, um, so it's going to be basic underwater demolition SEAL training. Now they then after that is a long course called SEAL qualification training. Uh, that for me, well, I went through SEAL whatever. I went through a thirteen week course and then a year of a like a 
transition before I became a SEAL. Then they'll send you to different schools, different specialties, and that's where you start your uh, um, your progression as far as advancing. Now the pipeline is good where you get free, you get static line jump, um, static line jumping, uh, free fall. Then you get to your SEAL team. And those, b before that, though, we would have to go to that school, free fall and the free fall jump master, all that thing. But getting school is just qualifying you for different stuff. So like the big quals are going to be breacher, and you can go to breacher school. Uh, breacher is the methods of entry guy that gets you in a house. So I'm going to break the window, chainsaw the door, uh, wall, blast the door, whatever. That's a breacher. Good call. Sniper, obviously a sniper, good call. Communicator, good call. Learn how to talk in radios, um, uh, anything in the air. And there's all kinds of different stuff from handling hazardous materials to... Uh, um, I went to a lock picking slash carjacking school in New Orleans. You know how to carjack? Yeah, I can yeah? steal cars. Isn't that cool? And boats. Uh, okay, so if I wanted, uh, you know, I wanted to carjack someone with you, how do we do it? Uh, well, I mean, the easiest way is have a gun and just tell them to get out. Okay, that's one. Because I'm a big believer too. I call it the. Uh, that is one I way call to do it. it. My my handgun charge card, and the way that works is you have a car, I have a gun. Now I have a car and a gun. Get out. Uh, but but like some of the technology now with with a lot of the electronics really hard to steal new cars so I'd look for something older like ideally I want to see like a 1984 Buick Skylark I'll pick the shit out of that thing oh so you could actually pick the lock oh, and yeah. then yeah what? pick the lock it in and then get behind it. yeah I mean some some of those is easy as a screwdriver so you can put a screwdriver and start the car oh yeah a lot of them you can just man it okay but so, again too when they say like as a sniper they're like well so when you're a sniper how do you stop a car do you shoot the engine block I'm like no I shoot the driver right simple. Did you know about Nicholas Irving while you're going through sniper school? Uh, no, I didn't know about. I don't know if he was in the army yet, um, but I, I'd heard about him once we started going to Iraq. Got it. And I know him now. I, again, I, we, I, I've never met him face to face. We've talked quite a bit, but uh, yeah, he's a regular guy. guest on the show. He's been on like three times now. Yeah, great guy. Great guy. Absolutely. He likes to stir the pot too. Yes, he does. Well, because he said stuff about being the best sniper. Of all, and, but when we met earlier, I was like, he's legit. Like, yeah. he's one of the best ever. Yeah. No, absolutely. Okay, so by 1998, you're 22 years old. You actually get sent to Albania? Albania, yeah, because I was at my first deployment in 1998 was part of a mobile, amphibi uh, mobile amphibious ready group, which means you get on a ship. As Navy SEALs, our job is to, so like the amphibious group, so the, for a um, amphib landing with Marines. When Marines storm the beaches, even back to D-Day, um, the Naval Co uh, Combat Demolition Units, NCDUs, just became underwater demolition teams, became SEAL teams. They would go in first, find the obstacles, blow the obstacles, find lanes for uh, amphib landing to come in. So we were on a group of three ships. Mine was a USS Austin, which was horrible. It was a flat bottom boat from like World War II across the Atlantic. <laughs> and then what we would do, because this was pre 9 11, we would do a lot of training exercises with coalition partners. So Albania was, that actually wasn't a training mission. There was some training there, but that was actually the first time in the Navy that I'd heard of Osama bin Laden, they Al-Qaeda was planning an attack in Albania because that was close to where a lot of Al-Qaeda fighters were in Bosnia. Mm -hmm. And so they were, so we went in there. So my first mission was uh, to run security on the embassy. Then for a big award ceremony, I was actually a counter sniper uh, behind uh, the president of Albania and some, some admirals. Right, because you're working with the president of Albania and Al-Qaeda was actually threatening the exercise? Yeah, they threatened, they, they threatened it. That's their, that's their gig. They, uh, they don't, uh, terrorists like to instill fear and they don't even need to do anything. They just tell you we're going to do something and that gets people scared. Um, so yeah, they just, they had us there and we thought we were cool. Again, pre 9 11, so we're like, yeah, real world stuff, first deployment, this is great. Because there hadn't really been any fighting. Um, Steels hadn't really fought a little bit in Somalia, a little bit in uh, Bullpatty Airfield in Panama. There was a couple guys got killed there and then Grenada, but. Other than Vietnam, there hadn't been a lot of fighting. So we considered having a counter-sniper mission being a big deal at the time. Okay. So you said while in Albania, that's the first time you heard about bin Laden. The first time in the Navy. I'd heard about him even before. Right. Uh, because, just because of the, like the 1993 bombing and the fatwa declared on America because exactly, of what we did in Saudi Arabia. Exactly. Yeah. So he already had the 1993 bombing and he was already causing all types of yeah. problems. Mm -hmm. But 9-11 hadn't happened yet. So in 2001, you were stationed in Germany. Yes. We, I'd done a deployment to Germany. I was still at SEAL Team 2. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we went to Germany where there's a unit. Naval, Naval Special Warfare Unit 2 was over there. I think, I think it still is. And we were going back and forth to Kosovo, uh, a peacekeeping mission. And again, because this is pre-9-11, we think that's a huge deal, just having a weapon locked and loaded and, and monitoring. And our job was, I was a sniper there, but it was more of an, an armed observer where I'm just watching. Like, we'll, we'll set up a, a hide site 
which is like camouflaging yourself and just watching places so no one is committing atrocities, basically. We didn't, I didn't get in a gunfight there at all, but then we went back to Germany and we're getting our gear cleaned up. Like, you know, I'm not cleaned up, it's just restaged for p possible trips and whatnot. And we were in the operations center at Unit 2 on Tuesday, September 11, 2001. TV was on, and then we we looked up, and the North Tower had been hit, and they were just saying, uh, that's a that's a, a small plane must have just hit one of the towers. They didn't even know the difference between the North and South Tower yet. And we, there's a couple SEALs in there, and we're like, that, a small plane? That's a huge building. That's a really big hole. And we're trying to figure out, and then the second plane hit. And it's like, oh, this is it. This is, uh, and then Osama bin Laden, this is obviously Al-Qaeda. Right. <laughs> I mean, what was the first thing that went through your head when you were seeing this disaster Everything happen? just changed. Everything that I knew just changed. Every uh, The whole train like a train bullshit, how it was just fun to be a SEAL. Some people joined because chicks dig it or whatever. It's like, no, well, we're going to go fuck some people up now. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna go fight. Right. You actually requested to be transferred to SEAL Team 6. Yeah. I immediately knew I needed to get over there because they're going to be the guys getting the, the big missions. Like, everyone's going to fight, and, and SEAL teams are going to fight, but SEAL Team 6 will get the big ones. And um, yes, and that was just SEAL Team 6 is obviously the, the counter-terror team, still in Virginia Beach, but it's really hard to get into. It's a long process. So I, right around then, I, I started my process of screening for SEAL Team 6, which takes a while because it's, it's, there's one selection course per year. So I ended up, uh, you know, obviously 2001, and then I, I screened positive for the 2004 selection course. So I did one more deployment with actually SEAL Team 4, and then I went over to 6. Okay, because right after 9-11, the U.S. invaded Afghanistan. 2003. Right. Oh, sorry, no, no, sorry, that was Iraq. Sorry, sorry, yeah, right after, yes, you're exactly. right. Exactly. Sorry yeah. about that. Right after, I, I think within a, a couple of weeks. Yeah, we had so, dudes in there. The, yeah, the, yeah, well, because we, the U.S. Soldiers. felt that bin Laden was actually based in Afghanistan. He was in, he was in Jalalabad, yeah. Exactly. So that was enough justification to basically dismantle the whole country. Now, you didn't go to Afghanistan. Not right away. Um, I went... I did that deployment. I, I said Iraq because that was 2003. Yeah. I did my deployment with SEAL Team 4 on another amphibious ready group, and we were going to invade Iraq from the north. And just the feeling at the time, like I, my feelings on Iraq right now are way different, but at the time, being like a 27-year-old Navy SEAL, we just got hit. I will invade any country you ask. I will go fight in Europe. I'll go fight in Canada, whatever you want. Uh, so we were getting ready to invade with the Marines through uh, Turkey in Iraq. But then... Uh, Something happened in Albania, uh, civil war. They, they were trying to oust our president, so we had to go evacuate that. Uh, you mean uh, 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 Liberia? Uh, Liberia. Yeah. I, keep, I keep saying the wrong stuff. I'm all over the place. Here. Liberia, West, yeah. West Coast Africa. Sorry about that. Right. I mean, this was the whole Iraq weapons of self destruction, weapons mass of mass destruction, yeah. which ended up there were no weapons of mass destruction, mm -hmm. but people were so upset over 9 yes. 11. And well, that's how they got us in there. Yeah. Because uh, I. Uh, maybe a week after 9-11, some of my friends in the Pentagon were saying they're already planning to invade Iraq. I'm like, why? Well, George Bush always wanted to invade Iraq. And that's because of a personal vendetta with Saddam Hussein. Right. There's a personal vendetta and there's a bigger issue of, you know, the whole situation with Kuwait. Because if Iraq had taken over Kuwait, they would have controlled something like 60% of the world's oil. Mm -hmm. And it would have really created financial chaos oh, yeah. with someone who was an enemy of the U.S. So I think that was really more of the real reason. I mean, yes, there were some personal uh, well, reasons with Bush, but it's like, if this guy really takes over the majority of the world's oil, the U.S. are going to have, you know, $40 a gallon gas. Well, I mean, then then you invade. We, you don't need to preempt something that over, over nonsense. Uh, um, well, but it already happened in Desert Storm before. Yeah, happened, and then you we see what I'm saying? And then, and, and, but, but we but also screwed, still... that was another Bush president, and we screwed that up too. Right. Because we got the Shia on our side saying, we're going to take Baghdad because uh, Saddam was a Sunni. The Shia followed followed us, and then we backed out, and then he slaughtered the Shia. So that he, George H.W. Bush did a horrible job with that. So we're back over there now. The, and and th uh, that, that invasion was what prompted Saddam Hussein to want to kill President H.W. Bush, that's why George W. Bush wanted to invade Iraq. And it's, the, I mean, why we didn't take their oil anyway. Well, we set up some companies over there. Maybe a couple. Yeah. Well, again, but 9-11 had nothing to do with it. This, this is li literally follow the money. And I agree with you. I mean, we have a tendency, I don't know if you noticed, we have a tendency to go to war with people with oil. Like, yeah. We don't give a shit what's happening in Sudan right now. We don't care what's happening in Syria right now. Genocide. Real genocide. I mean, there's open open air slave markets in Northern Africa right now. People yeah. don't talk about that. 
That's crazy. Libya, yeah. Okay, so now you're in Iraq. Now, have you seen any sort of, you know, combat up to this point? Yes, I did go to Afghanistan in 2004. So I, because I didn't get into Iraq, I went to Liberia, um, and we had to swim through the shark-infested water, which was a trip getting into Liberia. But then the uh, then I went to selection. Then I, my first deployment with SEAL Team Six was to Afghanistan, uh, and so I did a deployment there the summer of uh, 2005 when Turbine 33 was shot down, Lone Survivor mission. So I was there for that, and then my next deployment was uh, 2006. In sorry, that was 2005, 2006. I went to Iraq for the first time. Okay, so during this time, how much combat are you seeing? Um, a little bit, to the point where this is the first time in my life where I realize the media is full of shit, uh, because it's not as bad as they make it look, and that's common with pretty much everything. When I went to Afghanistan, it's it's uh, at first it's you know edge of your seat type stuff like there's going to be suicide bombers everywhere, but you slowly start to realize that even in a combat zone, most people are just trying to get on with their lives. Most people just want to raise their families. That's it. You got a couple assholes here and there. That's about it. Uh, to the point where some of the gunfights I was in is like, what are we missing? Because th are we this good or are they that bad? So we a couple gunfights here. Obviously, turbine three three getting shot down was horrible. That was a long uh, long couple days there trying to get Marcus Luttrell out. But then over to Iraq, the same thing again, because I'd watch CNN or whatever, Fox News, uh, bombs everywhere, stuff going off. Yeah, that happens, but not everywhere. And it, uh, m most people are not combatants. Well, there's the whole Operation Red Wings incident. Yeah, Red Wings was in 2005, June. I was in Jalalabad. I was running an out, I was helping run an outstation in Jalalabad. And uh, they, this is, so the airfield at Jalalabad at the time was where the Russians had staged during the 80s. So, but we didn't have much there. We had like maybe some barbed wire fences. We, we would actually drive motorcycles out there, put up the, the green light and then drive down there, put up the red light so the C-130 could land. And uh, just, I mean, th that time in Afghanistan too, it hadn't really popped off to the point where it was at the end. We would actually take motorbikes, go out in town, eat shawarmas from the food trucks and meet with the locals and stuff like that. And then one night, some guys that I knew from uh, SEAL Team 10 had flown into Jalalabad. I'm living in a safe house in the town proper, Jalalabad City. Drove out there, I saw a bunch of those dudes. Um, Dan Healy was there, a friend of mine I went through sniper school with. We were BSing about uh, Sam Adams. He was, he's from New England, talking about beers and how nice it would be to get home. And, I, and he told us the story of what they're doing. They just inserted four snipers into the Korengal Valley, which is pretty much the most dangerous place in the world. Um, and uh, they're going to find this guy named Ahmad Shah. Once they get eyes on, they send the code word Rick James back, and then they're going to assault. I, I actually asked my headquarters, hey, can I get on this raid? This is going to be awesome. And they said, there's no way in hell you can get on this raid because they have missiles in that valley. So, uh, you know, I said goodbye to them. We drove back to the safe house. They flew in, and then they got shot down. They lost uh, 16 guys, I think. Yeah, and then, and then they told us, you got to go find uh, Matt, Matt Axelson and Marcus Luttrell. Because Dietz and Murphy are dead, we got to go find those guys. But we're not going to fly you in. You got to find a way in. So we had to go steal trucks and mules and, and walk. Well, there was a situation where two Al Qaeda safe houses near the border between yeah. Afghanistan and Pakistan yes. were hit. Yes. You were involved in that? Um, was this in 2008 later? Uh, this was. The two safe houses across the border in Pakistan? Yeah. Yeah, that was my gig. Um... That, was my, that was my horrible plan that I came up with. Yeah, uh, your t you know your plan was. Uh... My plan was to get. So what Al Qaeda would do is uh, they would hide in Pakistan, and I don't know why we can't convince our leaders that that's where they are. But I knew that because of my rules of engagement, if I can have them see me and shoot at me, if I have what they call a tick troops in contact and a PID, a positive identification, I can pursue them up to ten clicks inside of Pakistan. So if they shoot at me and I can see them, I'll pursue. I'll hit that house and that house, and that was the. So this is later. This is uh, three years after. Red Wings, but because um, there was a dude named Zabit Jalil who was involved with Red Wings, that's why I wanted to go kill him because of that. So I ended up getting myself in a position just like the lone survivor. Um, we had a couple dudes. We went to the border. They saw us during the daytime. It was like they, they kept bringing gun trucks full of people up. And it was a moment where I was a ground force commander. And it was at the point where, okay, it's still the sun's up. We have the high ground, but because they're a couple hundred meters away, sort of on the downslope, we could probably run. If we run down the hill, we can call a bird, get out here. No one's worse for whatever. And so we decided to pack our stuff and leave as opposed to getting in a fight. We're just going to try to call the helicopter. Once we got down to a spot, uh, one of my Afghans I was with who didn't speak any English shouted out his first words in English ever, and that was, bad guys, bad guys. Mm -hmm. And that's when all hell started to break loose. So we started taking fire from three sides. There's like seven of us. And we're, there's a, I don't even know how many, I saw trucks full of 
15 to 20 guys per truck. And one of the scariest things I've ever seen is how fast these guys can run in the mountains. So I'm seeing like these brown pajamas and these dudes hauling ass, and then they're firing uh, bell-fed machine guns at us, RPGs, rocket propelled grenades, set to air burst. So it's a, it's a scary situation, because now we're in the low ground and we, we're trying to leave, but they got us. And uh, it's a scary situation because all you can really do is try to get as low as you can behind whatever you can find. And it's very uh, depressing to realize his gun can reach me, but mine can't, so I can't even shoot back. All we got to do is get air support. And like th there was like, um, getting shot at sucks when it cracks over your head, but it's scary when it ricochets. So it's like zip, zip, zing. And then when you have tracers go between your hand and your face, where like tracers are bullets that are on fire, but in, tween, in between each tracer is five real bullets. To a point, we got we were ambushed for an hour. Didn't get a shot off. Didn't have any air support. I already dropped my rucksack a, a hundred meters away because I needed to get to the radio guy to tell him because he, he had never called close air support in real combat, um, and he couldn't get that. He had no uh, no air support. There were RPGs that had exploded over us, and I remember looking to see if my legs were alive, uh, still there. And then you start to think weird stuff like, okay, now when I get shot in the face, does it hurt? Or do you just die? And then when you die, do you, where do you go? And like this whole weird stuff, we can't get air support. And all of a sudden my radio guy goes, well, hey, I got one, I got a bird. I'm like, awesome, I'll hit that checkpoint we talked about earlier. And he said, well, I can't. The batteries in my radio are dead. And I look at him and I'm like, because we have been out, we were out there a couple of days, so his battery's there. And I said, um, cause, so the reason I dropped my rucksack is because I'd heard from Vietnam guys that we used to wear a gear in what's called lines, lines of gear, first line, second line, third line. So your first line gear is your most important stuff. It's what you need. It's in your pockets. It's on your belt. So like your knife in your Copenhagen. Second line gear is your second most important stuff. Extra mags, grenades, water, and third line is your least important stuff. So that would be a sleeping bag, ground pad, and extra socks, foot powder, stuff like that. The reason the Vietnam guys told us is in case you need to run, you can ditch it in order. So ditch your ruck. You can ditch your second line and then just running with your stuff. Your gun is on your first line. I did that initially to tell Tony to do whatever. Uh, then if, anyway, he said, uh, I got one. I got a jet. I said, hit this. I can't. My radio's just died. I'm not a big believer in micromanaging, but I thought now was a proper time to do so. And I said, change the fucking batteries. He said, I can't. I don't have the spares. Remember, you do. Because I was carrying the spares in my rucksack. So I got to run to that damn thing. There was a dude maybe 50 meters away, maybe 30 meters away. He was shooting an, uh, a belt machine gun at us, which is bad enough, but what scared me about him was he looked like me. So you had a white guy with a red beard, but he's screaming, Allahu Akbar, God is great in Arabic, which means that's a Chechen. And those guys are serious. And you start, you realize if you're dealing with Chechens or bad dudes, I mean, you got dudes like that fighting in the UFC and they're champions. Hmm. You realize, okay, this, this day is going to end one of two ways now. We're going to win or we're going to die. That's And with these guys, it's you don't lose by um, surrendering. You save one bullet, and that bullet's for yourself. So I got to run to this backpack, right? So I start sprinting. And I remember saying something to Tony, like, don't tell mom I did this. So I'm running here. He's shooting at me. The sun's here. Like, we're not hiding. I get to the damn thing. There's bullet holes in the ruck. I open the ruck. I pull the two batteries, and I'm running back. I should have been dead here, but now I'm running back. I might make it. I chuck him the thing, and I roll over on my back. He's still screaming. Tony changed him out. I actually threw in a dip. It was one of the fun... Combat's kind of weird because the darkest times bring up some of the funniest humor. Hmm. I throw this dip in, and there's a green beret behind me. He goes, did you just put in a new dip? And I said, no, homie, I just, put in, I just freshened up the old one. <laughs> so we're laying there, and um, this pilot showed up. There was two of them that showed up though. One was one was dude one two, which is an, uh, an F fifteen, and he was he knew that. We, and the way that we have to call it in now, they're danger close. We can't give him coordinates because if he's excited and he puts in the wrong coordinates, like he puts in ours, guess who gets the bomb? Yeah. So I got to talk him in. And the way you do that is you're looking at the thing. You're like, so he's flying upside down. We're way down here. So he's like a 30, 35,000 feet, whatever. So you got to say, okay, can you see to the northeast the peak with the snow? Yes. Can you see down here to the south the river and the road enters? Yes. Okay, that's one unit of measure. Take half unit of measure, 097 magnet from my position, whatever. And he will turn, and then he he like comes around this way, and then he flies straight at you. And so he says, tally target. I mean, I see it, and you, and you look at him, and if you can see forward movement, you can say cleared hot. If you don't, you say abort. Because if you can't see, I mean, they're coming here. We're so close to this guy, I'm like, you're cleared hot. 
And, oh, oh, the first thing the guy said to me, was, here's how cool pilots are. The first thing he said before he asked where the target was, he said, um, just talk to me like I'm a man. And, and that was, and my response to him was, I see why women find you attractive. <laughs> right. And then we did it. And he come this way and I said, yeah, you cleared hot. And the guy next to me goes, um, well, what if the bombs drop on us? And I go, no problem. <laughs> Plug your ears, bro. And he drilled it. And then we had uh, another guy, Bones 2 which is a B1 show up. And so we ended up crushing uh, the, those guys. Well, let me ask you a question. Because you talk about, you know, taking some chewing tobacco. Mm -hmm. I mean, last time I tried to dip with chewing tobacco was in high school. And I remember I would, you get kind of high. You yeah, get kind of get, get cloudy more. headed. Mm -hmm. So why would you be getting high? In the no, this, of... this doesn't get you high. This just I was so used to. Di I was at a point with dip where okay. I would eat breakfast so fast because I wanted to dip. And okay, so it wasn't affecting you like that. No, no, no remember no, no, me? No, I was... get cloudy headed and no, dizzy no, and everything. Was, uh, else that was like just that. that was a culture thing, man. You got to honor the rituals. Okay, but I did black buffalo now, which is not tobacco. Just okay, saying. there was a point where you actually had to create new tactics and to become more silent. And you talked about how you guys would compete to see how many Al-Qaeda fighters you could touch yeah. while they were sleeping. So what, you would find a camp of sleeping Al-Qaeda's? Well, then... not even a camp, but like houses that they lived in. Huh. Because we learned early on, once the guns, the bullets started flying both ways, we literally changed everything that we were doing because you get clipped with one of these, your, your day's over. So we got to stop doing the old stuff that worked in the jungle for the Vietnam guys. Now we're fighting in the mountains, we're fighting in the desert. And uh, Al-Qaeda had been studying us. And they knew one of our tactics was if we get to, because we used to fly our helicopters right to, we call it the X. Uh, and if there's an open door, you just run through the open door. They, I mean, I'm like wide open. And that was our, well, it's already open, run. They knew that. So they would keep the doors open and they would have machine guns inside the room. And uh, like Delta got hit really hard in the, in the summer of, 07, um, of 06, 07. Um, so we all, and not, not, I mean, they just were there. And then as a, as a complete unit, like uh, J Joint Special Operations Command, we had to change all the tactics. Like, why are we landing on the X? Why are we yelling? Why aren't we going quiet? Don't talk. So we actually learned through like effective communication, the less we talk, the better we are. So stop yelling. Like if you ever see a movie and people start yelling, go, go, go. It's like, dude, we're gonna go, shut up. Mm. So we would sneak in and we st it's called counting coup. And it's an old Native American warrior thing where if you can go touch the enemy and their horse and leave and prove to that, like prove to the enemy you've been touched, they didn't do anything to you. Hmm. That's what the Native Americans used to. And so our squadron was Red Squadron. And so our, uh, I don't like the word mascot, our, our warrior was, we call him the Red Man. And so we took guys like uh, Chief Geronimo, Chief Crazy Horse. We want to take their energy with us to war. So we started doing the counting coup like they would do. So we would go into houses and you would like, we would sneak in. We'd walk for a couple hours, sneak in. Um, we found really quiet ways to break window, like silent ways to break windows and creep in that way. And then you walk up on these sleeping dudes. And um, the first thing you want to do when you're dealing with Al Qaeda or ISIS or Islamic Jihad or Hamas or, or, or Hezbollah, the first thing you got to do is check them for a suicide vest. So you walk in there and you literally run your hand down their entire body if you can feel anything. And if, if, you, if there's nothing on there, you wake him up by putting your finger on his mouth and you just go, shh, 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 shh. And then he wakes up, here's America's worst enemy, wake up, screams, shits his pants, and that's one for me. Hmm. If he has a suicide vest, no problem. Okay, were you killing these guys? If they have a vest on, yes. If, if they didn't have a vest, no, we'd take them, take them back and interrogate them. Okay. How many people did you kill in their sleep? In their sleep? I have never killed anyone in their sleep. Um, I, I would honest to go, other than a suicide vest, but I never did run into that myself. Okay. Um, I wouldn't do that because I, uh, I'm i just, a, I'm like, like, I, like not being a tough guy, I, I, I'm also not going to cheat. I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt. Plus, I'd almost rather interrogate you than just shoot you. Right. You were actually doing interrogations at one point. Yeah, I did a lot. I was a battlefield interrogator for a long time. I did hundreds. Okay. Now... Overseas, do the rules when it comes to torture really apply and so forth? Torture far? does not work. Um, I, I, it doesn't no, work? Torture does not work because... Historically, it's worked pretty well. Uh, no. Because It'll work on me. If you're you getting torture to me, I'll if, tell you no, whatever you want. You're going to tell you anything you think they want to hear. Okay. That, no, but now, okay, waterboarding works. That's not torture. It's way, way different. Waterboarding seems like it's torture. No, waterboarding You is, feel like you're drowning. How is that not you torture? You feel like it's drowning, but it's more of just an inconvenience because if you decide to tell them the truth, they just stop it and you, you walk away from it. You're fine. Torture is when you take out a power drill, start hitting kneecaps and shins. That's torture. When you start cutting shit off, when you, I don't even want to get into what torture is. I've seen some bad stuff that I don't want people to even know.
that I've, that I've seen them do to their own people. I, I don't torture. The, the way that you interrogate, honestly, is you catch them in a, two ways that we would always get our stuff. Catch them in a lie. And that, that's so, so here's, let's say, for example, we go into a house, take the house down, no shots fired. We got five dudes. And usually, so you got five dudes, and it's like the rules of three after that. Five dudes, that means 15 women and, and 45 kids, right? Mm-hmm. So you separate the women and the kids. They're fine. Watch out for the women sometimes because they can be shady. So keeps, and we would have like what's called cultural sensitivity teams, which are our women to deal with their women. I disagree with that at first, but once I learned the actual culture and we are in their country, do that. And then what you do with the five dudes, it's very simple. You separate them into different rooms so they can't hear each other. You bring in your interpreter. And the way that you do it is you make your interpreter stand behind the guy you're talking to. So I'm looking at him, my interpreter's behind him because I don't want them talking to each other. I will talk to him, you answer him, he tells me what you said. And it's as simple as this. How many men are in the house? Who's the man of the house? What are the names? Three of the guys will tell you exactly. There's five guys, here's their names. Two of the guys won't know, there's your bad guys. Simple. So now you got them, separate them. They're, you're going to be taking a ride. We're going to bring you back to the big interrogation. But the first thing you do now, find the oldest child in the house, okay? The oldest male child. And you pull him aside and you kind of brush him off and like, hey, ask him something so simple. And he'll answer like, thank God, finally, a man of the house. Built him up. Who are these two assholes over here? It's like, I don't know. They just came in from Saudi Arabia. They blah, 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 blah. Thanks, buddy. Seriously, that's how you do it. Torture doesn't work. I would still disagree with you. <laughs> I think torture You're going to talk, but you... I think torture still works. Yeah, but if you're getting... I mean, if you look at throughout history, the, if you're the, getting... the number of, you know, kingdoms and countries that have tortured people... You know, it's been around since They're the They're going to admit anything. That's why you they, they uh-huh. burnt witches at the stake because they finally right. admit, that admit you're a witch as they, they're skinning you alive. Once you admit it, then they burn you. It's like the, you're going to tell them what you want to make this stop, then they're going to kill you. That torture is a, is a bad idea. Yeah, I remember I interviewed uh, Tony Yeo, and he was saying how in Queens, if you were snitching, they would throw you in a basement filled with rats with peanut butter all over your legs. Uh, they're they not trying to get you, information. They're they just torturing you. They make you, you. A shit, eat a shit sandwich. Like, the that way, type of stuff. The way that torture will work is if you, someone that you want to tell you stuff, you make them watch you torture someone else, mm. then they'll talk. Okay. But if someone getting tortured, like, if, if if you're a flat earther and I start skinning you, you're going to, okay, the world's round. Done. Because yeah. I have to get this to stop. Well, but isn't there a specific piece of information that you need to get out of that person? If they finally give it to you, then the torture will stop? I mean, maybe. I mean, look, I'm not trying to say there's a one-stop shop. I'm just saying uh, okay. catching, catching someone on a lie is uh, worked for us a lot better. Well, you had a situation where you killed a man who was in bed with his wife. Yeah. he Yes, that was one of the situations, too, because we had come in soft. It was a big McMansion in Iraq. I think we were, I might have been in Ramadi. And we entered silently. I immediately ran into a guy that was armed. I killed him. Then I went... I did a one-man entry into a bedroom, which you shouldn't do, but war as hell. I'm in there by myself, and a guy was in bed with his wife asleep. And I want, and again, I, I want to wake him up. I did, and he started kicking at me. And I'm like, that's fine. You, you, I just woke you up. I have a green face. It's 3 in the morning. You're terrified. He kicked again. I'm like, all right, you got to knock that off. Now he's got an AK over here, and he looked at it. And I look at this guy, and I go, don't, don't do that. Don't. And he reached down for it, and I killed him. Okay. Was that your first kill? Oh, no. How many kills have you done at that I point? I don't know. Um, my first kill, I think, was in Iraq in 06. No, 05? 06. What was that situation about? Uh, we ended up hitting a major Al-Qaeda target in Ramadi again. Um, with It was a joint op with SEAL Team 6, Delta Force, and the Special Air Service. And then I had one guy from the Special Boat Service, which is the two uh, premier uh, British, UK national... Um, Mission forces, they're, they're tier one units. And they're, they're, like we inserted by walking, Delta and SAS flew in. So it just started this hornet's nest. And that was one of the first times we were using the tactics of being quiet because when we went in the first house, it was a, there was like five of us in a hallway, long hallway, dark, but we weren't talking, weren't shining white lights. And a dude at the front, came, uh, at, the, at the end of our hallway came out with an AK. He looked down and he couldn't see any of us. And we're all standing there. He could have greased all of us. But he didn't see us because we're being quiet and we're on night vision. He went back in and then we assaulted. And then me and a, another guy went out when the, a major gunfight started outside and we just started doing our tactics. We both got our first kills at the same time. Actually, the guy next to me was the sniper that initiated the fire to rescue Captain Richard Phillips. Later. Okay. Yeah, we'll talk about that in a yeah. second. I'm just saying that. So that's like we're yeah. getting, we're, we're all now getting kills together. So this is before a lot of guys got kills. Now we're all getting. 
Did your initial kill bother you at all? Um, no, no, it was fast. It was just, um, it was almost at a point of competition. Like I know guys that have kills. I don't have one yet. I need to get one to get in the club. And I blasted this dude. And I was like, well, that's, I guess I'm in the club. Then, no, did a button. No, he was, I mean, he was, uh, uh, he was trying to maneuver on us. So it was, didn't okay. Know. I mean, you could justify every kill as self-defense. If I don't do it to them, oh, they'll yeah. do it to me. So was there any level of, did you ever have a nightmare? Did you ever have any regret? Or was it like, hey, listen, it's the war. Only, the, They're trying to kill me. I'm killing them. Life goes on. The, the regret is, and the older you get, the what you realize is the only reason I killed this guy is because he went for a gun. Why did he go for a gun? Well, because I'm in his room at three in the morning. Why am I in his room? Well, because these politicians decided this. And then your mind starts to wander. Like if like we were only, we were born on different sides of the planet. That's why we're fighting. That's it. We don't know each other. So then your mind starts getting creative. Like, well, now what if I met him somewhere else? What if he and I met at a cafe in Europe and had coffee? Does this guy know like some good jokes? Would he tell me stories about his dad? That's what starts to mess with you. It's like, did we need to be there doing this? That's why I get pissed about Iraq. Okay. So 2009. There was the Captain Phillips yes. uh, incident, mm -hmm. which a movie got made later on mm -hmm. with, was it Tom Hanks? Tom Hanks, yeah. Okay. Great movie, by the way. Tell me about what led up to this. Well, the, um, the shipping companies weren't having armed guards on their ships as they crossed the Horn of Africa. So they come through the Suez Canal, go around Somalia, and they're trying to get like into uh, Kenya or whatever. And local Somalis realized that they were unarmed, so they can go take these. And they started taking these down. And the thing was, they weren't hurting anybody, and they weren't um, really terrorists. They were just criminals. But the insurance company always paid the ransom every time. So it's like, well, I live in Somalia. I'm poor. I'll go get a couple hundred thousand dollars off this gig. So they started doing it. And uh, it, it hadn't been an American until that point that Captain Richard Phillips from the Marist Alabama got taken. And so we were we were aware of it. Uh, but then we did get, so SEAL Team 6 is designed to rescue Americans at sea. That's what we do. That's our bread. Anything you can think of, we'll do it. So we kind of thought it was coming uh, because they're going to want to rescue them. I know that some FBI guys went there. They're trying to negotiate and whatever. And then they they did make the call with us, which was, which was kind of interesting because the Obama administration had just gotten in there. And so this has like never been done before. This is a ballsy call because you're in international waters. We're not at war with them. What are we going to do? So we were thinking about that, and it was actually uh, my birthday, Good Friday, April 10th, 2009. And I was at my daughter's Easter tea party at her preschool. And I was bringing her, I had a pink plate. I brought her oh, um, smiley face cupcakes and cookies and shit, the four-year-olds eat. Uh, and then I got a call that a cat, we're going right now. So I had to kiss her and leave. Like on a long weekend on my birthday, Good Friday, I have to kiss my daughter and go to war from a preschool classroom. Okay, so you, you're part of 108 soldiers. Yeah that went after the ship. Yes. You guys actually landed on the ship. Uh, well, we jumped. So we we took off from Virginia. We flew right to there. So just about 16 hours we jumped. Full head count. Um, I was a lead jumper for that, which was the which was cool because here here's what we've been training for forever. Never, SEAL Team 6 was commissioned in two, uh, 1980. Never been done. This is 2009. And so we finally got to go. So we made the jump. But we didn't know what we were going to do because we would never considered a fully engulfed lifeboat being towed by a destroyer. So we didn't know what we were going to do. We had to come up with plans. So we simply put snipers on there to watch them while we came up with a different plan, make sure nothing unsafe happens type shit. Right. So you're supposed to rescue Captain Phillips. Yes. You weren't supposed to kill the pirates. Um, no. We wanted, I mean, ideally we could say, hey, uh, we know you guys are seasick. We know you realize you screwed up. You're out of cot. You're hungry. Cod is the drug. Cod's the drug. Yeah. Um, yeah. If they would have come out, they, all they had to do was say, okay, good. And we probably would have just let them go. Um, and that was one of my plans. My plan that I came up with was uh, give them communication with their village elders, let them talk on walkie talkies, tell them we're going to bring them in, and then bring them in as the sun's going down. Once it gets a little bit dark, turn about two miles north, jam the communications. My team of seven dudes will be on the beach when they come out. Here's the pirates. Here's and we'll say, hey, we want our guy. You can leave, or we get in a gunfight, we kill him. And as we were waiting for that, I was actually drinking coffee in the chief's mess, and the snipers took the shots, and they told us, hey, we got him. Uh, how many pirates actually got killed? Three. Okay. I remember the pirates uh, made a statement how upset they were. Right. Really? Were they upset? Yeah, so they were, were upset. We? They basically said, no, you know, we don't kill, we just steal. It's so unfair that they I mean, killed us. It seems like a simple lesson to me. Don't fucking steal from me. I won't yeah, kill man, you. Yeah, man, listen, I had no problems with them getting killed. You <laughs> yeah, go and steal I a have, whole boat. I have not lost any sleep over that mission. 
Right. And I remember I interviewed uh, Eric Prince, yes. the founder yes. of Blackwater. Blackwater. Mm-hmm. And he was involved with Somalian pirates at one point. Oh, I'm sure he was, yeah. Yeah, like he actually figured out, you know, he was sending planes all around, figured out where they all lived, mm-hmm. where the boats were parked, yeah. and they basically started attacking those villages and they got it fixed. Yeah, I'm not aware of what he, I know he's a brilliant dude. I know Blackwater's a great company. Um, I don't know what they did as far as, because you're, you're, it's kind of dicey with international law and contractors. So I'm not aware of what they did, but I mean, they eventually started arming people, putting them on the ships. We haven't had a big issue with it since. Yeah, I mean, uh, I just interviewed. He basically trained 2,000 Somalis for an anti-piracy oh, yeah. operation in the Gulf of Aden. Of Aden, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, that, yeah, that they do. Yeah, we did a lot of that with tra- training other countries, yeah. Yeah. I just met our guys. We didn't, like, with uh, as far as black, black, Blackwater contracts in, in Iraq, I don't, I'm not aware if they did that in Somalia. Were you around Blackwater guys? Uh, I know a lot of them. I know a lot of dudes that got out to, because when when the wars kicked off, especially Iraq, dudes got out of the Navy and started making like $1,200 a day. And that's Compared to a Navy paycheck, that's pretty big. I mean, were you around during the Nassau Square uh, massacre? No. I mean, I was in the Navy. I wasn't there for well, that. You heard about it. I'm aware of it, yeah. I, I don't mean, buy all of it. Um, I it's mean, it's a dicey situation. Oh, it's really yeah. dicey on both sides yeah. too. And, and on both once, sides, again, yeah. once the bullets start flying, it's it is what it is because you can come to a point like I'm. I don't care about policy. I care about myself and the guy next to me. Right. Um, and and again, I mean, Al Qaeda is good enough to see that massacre. They can walk through, pick up all the five five or all the seven six two brass, and look, we didn't shoot at all. These are all five five six. This is all bad guy. Which I don't know if you know this. Al Qaeda lies to us a lot. I'm sure. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, so nine eleven happened. And Bin Laden was essentially a ghost. Yeah, he was uh, a ghost the whole time. Yeah. I, I, Tora Bora, they almost got him. Right, that was in Afghanistan. Yes. Right. I remember at one point they came close to actually really getting him. Close. That we were just so young, so new to the war, that we thought we could negotiate his uh, capture by the locals and then hand him over. It just didn't work out that way. So then Operation Neptune Spear mm-hmm. came around. When did you first hear about it? I heard about it. April 2011, so th- about three weeks before we launched. And I just finished a, a, a trip to Afghanistan as a senior enlisted advisor of a couple different outstations. So I was actually living again in Jalalabad at a, uh, I was at a CIA place, which is funny. You should see the way they roll up. It's like a European resort. They got kick-ass gyms, outdoor CrossFit stuff. They got a bar with happy hour every night. Uh, I had my own room with a shower, and then you know it was awesome. And then we, and I didn't know at the time, but I'm, I'm actually dealing with some of the Bin Laden team. They they were very tight lipped about what they were doing. So we came back after that trip, right around March of '11, and then I found out about Bin Laden in April. Right. So based on intelligence, they had located a house in Pakistan. Yes. The house was built in 2004. Mm-hmm. It was a three story compound at the end of a narrow dirt road. Yes. About two and a half miles from the city, uh, Abbottabad? Abbottabad, yeah. Abbottabad. Uh, Abbottabad is about 100 miles from the Afghanistan uh, border. Now, the thing about this house, which is different, is that it's on a plot that's eight times larger than all the other houses around it. It had 18-foot concrete walls with barbed wire, Yep. two security gates. There's a third floor balcony with another seven-foot privacy wall, no internet, no landline phones, and they would burn their garbage. Burn in the trash, yeah. Have their own animals inside, yeah. And based on, you know, drones and satellites, they would see this kind of tall man that would walk around in the courtyard and kind of, you know, walk around, walk around, but they didn't have, you know, enough high-definition type of cameras to say that's really him. It's just a tall guy, might be Bin Laden, might not be Bin Laden. they were calling him the pacer. The pacing and man, what, right. Uh, what they were inter- the, now, these analysts are really good, too. When I met the CIA team, because it was funny before we joke about the worst thing about the CIA is they make too many movies about the CIA and they think they're cool. Uh, this team was that cool. And they could just, based on the way he was walking, the time of day, his shadows, how tall he was. So they got him about 6'4", and they noticed that he would he sometimes would stop to talk to people in the compound that were doing menial tasks, but he never helped, which means he's very important. He doesn't do that shit. Um, and, yeah, so, so the woman who was basically running that team was 100% convinced that was Bin Laden. And that's she's the reason that we actually went. Okay. So there was a team of 28 people. Uh, 28 people at first because we had some uh, guys that were there in case, in case somebody got hurt, went down. So, But we went in with 23, not including the pilots and the air crew. Right. You were originally in South Beach, but then you got sent back yes. to Virginia Beach. Mm-hmm. 
when you got sent to Virginia Beach, they tell you what this was? No. They brought 28 of us into a room, and the way it started was they said, we found a thing, and this thing is in a house, and this house is in a bowl in a country, and you guys are going to go in there and get this thing. You're going to bring it back to us and show it to us. Okay. That's, that's how it started. It. And literally, it's like, okay, no problem. What's the thing? Well, we can't tell you. Okay. Which country? Can't tell you. Where's the bowl? Can't tell you. How we get there? Can't tell you. How much air support we got? None. Okay. That was it. And then then they started saying other stuff like, yeah, there's these weird power lines between countries or whatever, the cables, and you're going to... It's like, I don't even know how to repair them. I'm not a hard hat. What are you talking about? Blah, blah, blah. And here's where it got interesting, though. They said, well, you're not bringing any Air Force guys with you. You're bringing just Navy SEALs. And that's important because our Air Force guys are the best at what they do. We have the paramedics, the PJs, who are basically like, it's going with a surgeon who knows how to fight. And then you get your CCT, who are the true silent professionals. The most dangerous man on the mountain is the CCT. He calls in the bombs. He's not coming either, just SEALs. So if you used to carry a radio, guess what? You're the radio guy. If you used to be a medic, you're the medic. So we're getting our gear adjusted to whatever the hell. And we don't know why we're not bringing the Air Force. Um, and then like dudes would come up to us, like, our big lockers like look like cages. Dudes would come up from other squadrons, like Gold Squadron, and say, hey, dude, what's this super secret mission? And I remember going, I don't know. And they go, come on, you can tell me. I'm like, I have no fucking idea. I'm just fixing my gear up. And so that happened day after day. And like other, sh this is where a lot of animosity started because other shooters that are at SEAL Team 6, the tier one unit, they don't even know what it is. So they're like, well, I thought I was a tier one guy. Why can't I know? This is bullshit. So they're, they're automatically that shit starts. So we're getting our gear ready. And finally, um, on a Friday, they said, okay, dude, um, go home, be with your kids. Have some scotch when they go to sleep. Wake up Sunday. Get your ass back here like 05. We're going to drive down to North Carolina. We're going to read you in on what we're doing. So we're all tired. It's Friday. It's like, okay, well, who's going to be at the read-in? And they're, they're like, well, the vice president, the secretary of defense, the secretary of the Navy. It's like, what the fuck? And they're going down this list. And they said, like, State Department, whatever, and CTC pad, blah, blah, blah. There's, and I caught that. I'm like, CTC, that's that's CIA counterterror Pakistan, Afghanistan. Because we thought we are going into Libya. Mm. For because the Arab Spring just started, like the, we're going after Gaddafi. If why would the Pak Afghan be there if we're going to we're not going to Libya? So I went home and thought about this. We came back on Sunday. I'm in a car with four dudes, two guys in front of me, and I'm actually my boss is sitting next to me. And I explained to them exactly what I just said to you. And I said, "This isn't Gaddafi. This is Bin Laden. They found Osama Bin Laden." My boss looked at me and he goes. That's exactly what I was just thinking. So he and I are just calmly discussing, and this is a true story. Uh, my buddy uh, is driving the van. He looks at me in the rearview mirror, and I kid you not, he goes, man, Nisro, that's my nickname, Nisro, if we kill Osama bin Laden, I will suck your dick. <laughs> so that was embarrassing. I hope we didn't carry through on Well, that. three weeks to the day, three weeks to the day, we're literally standing over his body, and I go, hey, homie, now's a good time as any. And he goes, for, well, fuck you. I'm like, well, you said it. So he didn't, no, I never collected Okay, so you said the next meeting was going to include the vice president. That well, was he didn't show. He didn't show up. But that, that's that what was going to be thinking. Biden, right? Yeah. Okay. So we were thinking. I mean, that the, the vice president doesn't need to be in a briefing for a mission. We're going to do okay. unless it's Osama bin Laden. So, at one point, you are told that you're going to go kill. So then this is the drive down. We we had that conversation. Then we get to a spot, this weird base with a, this little teeny house, a one story classroom. Like we walk in, there's half a pot of coffee and a dozen donuts, and then a room with an armed guard, and we go in there. There's this group of people sitting over here, and the commanding officer, SEAL Team 6, walks in front of us and said, all right, guys, the reason you're here is this is as close as we've ever been to Osama bin Laden. And so we like look around the room, and it was so cool because there was no cheering or high-fiving. It was, um, okay, we going right now? We're ready. Okay. How would you feel when you realized you are going to be part of the team what an honor. go get what an honor. bin Laden? Just, I mean, when I first got to SEAL Team 6, like, I remember now that I'm at SEAL Team 6, I'm going to work with Delta Force. Maybe I'll meet the guy that's going to kill bin Laden. That's like, that's that level. But then when they said, well, you're the team, it's like, wow. That, I mean, just an honor. I know how good these dudes are. And I was in a position, too, even at SEAL Team 6, as a senior dude, I loved waking up in the morning because every single day I could go to work with people who were way better than me. Hmm. It was just awesome. And But now it's like part of this team. And they, they picked us based on the most qualified, most experienced dudes available. Now, I was one of that 23. It was awesome. Okay, so the CIA made an exact model of that house. Yeah. For you guys to, to train the, out. To the tree, yes. To the tree. Exact model. So now you have the Bin Laden house where in North Carolina? Yes. So we have the the, the big house made out of like uh, Connex boxes. Then we have the, the the model 
which is about the size of a of a, a dining room table, to scale. Yeah. Right. And you guys start doing twelve hour training yeah. missions. Minimum of twelve in hours. In this house. Yeah. Okay, this is the way we're going to do it. We're mm-hmm. going to come in this way. Well, so- they, they were good enough to give us tactical control, meaning the powers that be, they're going to send us, let us tell you what we're going to do when we get there. And they were very cool about letting us. So we came up with the perfect plan and we rehearsed that plan every single day. Right. Because there's also a window because they're saying that he might actually move on September 11th. He was going to move, yeah. yeah. And we and our window is uh, 48 hours every 30 days for 0% illumination. We want to hit him when it's as dark as possible. So we had that... That two days, that that uh, um, early May, that weekend, you got two days of zero percent of loom, or we got to wait thirty days, and he might leave. So, like, there's a lot of variables, and even like the way that it worked is uh, this this Saturday right before the Sunday that we left, they had the correspondence dinner in D.C., and we couldn't launch then because the entire cabinet is there, the entire press corps is there. If the cabinet gets up and leaves, the press corps is like, what is that? Yeah. So we're gonna lo- well, even we we had we got word to President Obama. Like, hey, the weather's bad, so we're going to launch tomorrow. And he goes, uh, it's 2011. I know what the weather is. And we said, well, it's the correspondence dinner. And that was cool, too. If you ever seen the footage of uh, – he was getting roasted by Seth Meyers. Hmm. And he – so President – and just a gangster. President Obama is sitting there, and Seth Meyers is roasting him about Bin Laden on C-SPAN at the dinner going, you know, Osama Bin Laden actually hosts a show on C-SPAN every day because no one watches C-SPAN. And he's like, you can't even find him. And, and Obama said, they're like, knowing we're going to kill him tomorrow. Didn't say a word, just poker face. That was dope. Okay, so this house that Bin Laden is in is located in Pakistan. Yeah. What was the state of diplomatic relations between the U.S. and Pakistan at that time? Well, I think it was an understanding that if we find him in Pakistan, we're going to come get him. Like, you just as long as you know we're going to come. But also the understanding that if we... If we tell, like, because one of the options, they, they told the room full of shooters, um, yeah, one of our options is a, is a multilateral mission with the Pakistan. It's like, oh, yeah, fine. Tell them. He'll be gone that day. Right. So right. we got to go unilateral. So it was okay. I, I mean, they ended up being very embarrassed because we went and got, because they're, they're, they're protecting. Right. No, no I understand. So it's because this, you know, the house is located in Pakistan, mm-hmm. but you go and tell the Pakistani government and someone might go and, yeah, you don't tell you know, them. You tell going. them, hey, you're about to get hit. Nope. Oh, they'll go they'll move. Go yeah. move. But on the flip side, I mean, imagine if Mexico flew into San Diego to kill a whole bunch of people. It would be an in- international incident. Totally. You know, you can't just go into a, another country and kill someone there. I agree. Regardless, terrorists or not, this could really be a, a big problem. Yeah. Well, we and we we talked about that too. Like, what if we get there and we get stuck? Because the first responders to that house, and this is like a moral thing with us, like a, a human thing. Uh, what if we get there and the first responders are the Pakistani police? I don't want to kill those dudes because they're just doing their job. We're right. invading them. Exactly. And so we had to have all that like worked out. But I mean, as far as the, you're either with us or with the terrorists, it's an understanding. You find Bin Laden, we're coming to get him. Same thing with with uh, um, the, what's his name from ISIS? Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. We went into Syria and got him. I didn't. Right. So originally the mission, was it to bring him back alive or was it to kill him? Call it a kill capture. Uh, instead of a capture kill, meaning my the way I described this mission was you have less than one second to convince me not to shoot you in the fucking face. And he didn't. So I shot him. Right. Meaning that if you put your hands up, get on your knees. If he came, or, if he came out of the shower with nothing on and his hands up and I can see everything, I'll, I might capture him. The chances of me shooting him are about 98%. He better really convince me in less than a second. Now, are you going into this mission with... There's a reasonable chance I might die. No, it's so it, extremely high risk. The helicopters were so new, the technology that the president didn't even know about them until the chief of staff of the Air Force briefed him. So we don't know if they work. With that, we, even though we have the four best pilots in the world from TF-160, they have only been flying these helicopters for a week. There's a problem. Um, the technology might not work. We, we're going into Pakistan, which is not a third world country. They might shoot us down. 90 minutes in, they can shoot us down. As soon as we land, there will be a gunfight. If anyone's going to blow the whole place up with him and his family, and it's Osama bin Laden, we're going to run out of fuel on the way out. We're going to get trapped there and either shoot it out or end up dying slowly in a Pakistani prison. Very convinced it's it's going to be bad. It's going to be bad. It could be. But, and and by the way, anyone at any time, you can pull yourself off this mission. You don't need to go. Did anyone pull out? Anyone could pull out. Did anyone pull out? No. Oh, uh, no. Sorry. Two guys did before they knew what the mission was. When they mm. thought it was that bullshit with the... Uh, Korean cables under the ocean. 
one guy was like, yeah, I got a trip I'm running in January in LA. I'm going to pull myself off this mission so I can get that ready. Another guy said, well, we just finished deployment. I need to get my uh, shoulder surgery. I'll do that now, skip this mission. So other guys, and like, they're taking themselves off the bin Laden raid without realizing it. Got it. But the other guys that were on there, I mean, we had the conversation. Um, I remember talking to a guy, said, look, don't take this the wrong way. Um, I'm going, 100% going. I just need to say it out loud, okay? If we know we're going to die, why are we going? Which is a fair question. And we talked about it over that table. After 13 hours of training, whatever, maybe a, a cold one, it's like, you know, we're, we're not going for the fame. We're not going to get the reward money. We're going after Osama bin Laden for the first Americans to fight al-Qaeda toe-to-toe to the death. And those are the passengers on United 93. We're going after bin Laden for the first responders at Ground Zero, who instead of a handshake, they hugged each other and ran up as other people. They, people were running out to live. They were running up to die. We're going after Osama bin Laden for the single mom who dropped her kids off at elementary school on a Tuesday. And then 45 minutes later, she jumped to her death out of a skyscraper because that is a better alternative right now than whatever the hell's going on inside at 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit that we will never know. And she looked down and made a decision, probably grabbed a stranger's hand, and her last gesture of human decency was holding her skirt down as she jumped. She was never supposed to be in that fight. I am. And that's why we're going. Okay, so now the mission's about to start. 24 SEALs. 23. 23 SEALs. Well, okay, 23 guys. There was... uh, uh, there was a one explosive ordnance disposal guy from SEAL Team Six with us, uh, the bomb guy, and then we had uh, we had some. Uh, I don't know who he was. He was an agency guy that spoke fluent Urdu without an accent. I have never seen him since, but he's cool. So that's the crew. And so we we actually were we're in Jalalabad. We got the green light, I think on a Friday, and then we're going to launch on Sunday. And the coolest part about that was we went into um, uh, a briefing room for a pre-brief right before we launch. And Admiral Bill McRaven, who was the overall commander that sold it to President Obama, he was the commander of JSOC. He gave us a speech right before, and we didn't need a motivational speech, like we're good. But he said to us, and I'm talking like, we're gonna go put our body armor, my guns right here, we're launching right after he talks to us. He said, all right guys, last night I watched my favorite um, movie, it's called Hoosiers. And if you're not familiar with the movie, it's a team from Hickory, Indiana, a basketball team with like seven dudes. Um, they've never been out of Hickory, Indiana, but they, they're coached so well, they end up in the state championship in Indianapolis. And as these kids walk into the, because they play in the small gym, and now they're in this huge arena, and they're all starstruck. It's empty. They're all starstruck. Uh, they're going to play here tonight, and coach realized that, and he says, hey, grab that tape measure. What's the measurement from the back of the rim to the free throw line? It was 15 feet. Cool. Get on his shoulders. What's the measurement from the rim to the ground? 10 feet, coach. And he said, you'll find these are the exact measurements in your gym in Hickory. This is just a bigger audience. Mm. And he goes, gentlemen, you do this every night. This is just a bigger audience. And so we left to delete. And this is, I think, the only time I, ref- I called Admiral McRaven Bill. And I said, Bill, you're so busy mm. selling this mission. I doubt you watched Hoosiers last night, <laughs> but you were born to give us that speech right now. Okay. So 24 people yep. on this mission. Two Black Hawk helicopters, yes. the the super advanced ones yes. that have twenty three really shooters on two Black Hawks. Twenty three shooters, two Black Hawks, super advanced Black Hawks that's supposed to evade uh, radar yeah. and so forth. Hopefully, that's what we're gonna find out tonight, aren't we? So you guys start to approach the compound. You're in the helicopter that actually tried to land in the courtyard. No, I was in the second one. So dash one and dash two. Dash one was gonna do. Um, was gonna hover and throw ropes out, and guys go fast rope down them. Slide down, snipers watch them, they fast rope. We were gonna drop off snipers, a machine gun, the dog, the interpreter, then my team's going to the rooftop of the main building. So we're gonna fast rope onto that, and we're j- basically gonna jump um, into the balcony. I don't know how, I don't know, we'll figure it out. Like to the point where guys are actually leaning over to get shots that way, I don't know. And then we're gonna either shoot them through the window or we're gonna get them like that. We're gonna hit them top to bottom, that was the plan. But when we, put our guys out, we went up. The pilot from this one saw that one. He crashed, landed. He didn't crash. He he realized something with everything from uh, an updraft to the, di- uh, you know, different uh, fences to it was warmer than we thought, like one degree Celsius. He realized if he powers it up, he's going to flip it. Everyone's going to die. But if he can pin the tail on the that wall and stick the nose in, we might live. He made that decision 
that quick. And he put it there. Our pilot saw that happen, realized if he can't hover, I can't hover. And he just went back down. And then through, again, effective communication, like reading off each other, he's saying, get out. So we got out outside of the courtyard. Now we got to get in. And even stepping out, like my right foot went down, looking at the big walls and then the house, Bin Laden's house, like, I guess we start the war from here. But because we prepped so well, I knew on this side, there's one of those double doors. So we'll hit that first, blast that, and um, we'll enter from there. So we went to that side, uh, called up a breacher. He put um, a seven foot charge of C6 on the double door, which is, a, that's like a master key that will open anything. So he blasts that, it opens like a tin can, but then there's a brick wall right behind it. So he, he looked back and he goes, fail breach, this is bad. And I said, no, this is good. That's a fake door and nobody does that. He's in there. I know there's a double door here that opens, that's the carport where they've been coming in and out. So I, I heard the first bird, I heard him saying dash one going around, dash one going around, meaning they're, they, they're doing a racetrack. They took fire, they're just gonna be coming back. What they were saying was dash one going down. So I said, hey, this is so-and-so, I'm gonna blast the carport. They said, no, don't blast it, we'll open it. And I didn't know they were, and the door opened and a thumb came out oh, with a glove that I recognize. They're in there, right? And I'm at a point in life now where it doesn't matter how they got there. They, they're just there. We don't need to worry. It's like when I talk to professional football teams, the offense, I say, it doesn't matter why it's second and 15. It just is. And what we have in common is the clock is ticking. What do we do now? So we went in there. I had no, like, I saw the air crew dudes standing on the wall. So these are the pilots and the air crew guy. Ameri different uniforms, but American flags. I remember walking past them going, who the fuck are these guys? But that's the air crew. So a gunfight's happening. We get into the main uh, the main house, which has been Laden's house, first floor. Other dudes are now ahead of me. So because where we were let off, I now have a front page, front row seat to the greatest mission in modern history. And the first thing you do, I hope you're never in this situation, if you're ever in a gunfight in a house, get out of the hallway. That's just bad place to be. Bullets fly down walls and shit. So I get in there and I'm watching dudes and they, my guys were so cool. I was so proud of them. Cause this house, like I'm looking for bombs now. Like this house is gonna blow up, but it didn't bother anybody. Everyone's doing exactly what they should do. Slow is smooth, smooth is fast. Go through your process. You know, check the lock, kick the door, mechanical, explosive. And I'm in this room watching them and the dude next to me who was in the bird that crashed said, helicopter crash. And I said, which, oh my God, which helicopter crashed? Because we have two more birds behind us by 45 minutes, but they're conventional. Mm -hmm. Oh, they're not conventional, but they're not stealth. They're, they're still the best yeah. pilots in the world. And he said, bro, our helicopter crashed in the front yard. Like you walked right past it. And I, I, it's registering. Okay, that's what happened. They crashed. That's why they're all here. As we're talking about this, where the pilot had pinned that tail, and you can see the picture when, it, when we blew it up, it fell out. The sniper with Cairo, the dog, and, and then she's the handler running around. The sniper saw that and he came over, he didn't realize they crashed. He came over the radio and said, guys inside, be on alert. Okay, they're definitely ready for us. They have a training mock-up of our super secret helicopter in their front yard. And the boss said, no, jackass, that's ours because we crashed. And the sniper goes, yeah, that makes a lot more sense than this shit. I was saying, so this is the conversation where it's like, guys, shut the fuck up. So that's when we, you know, whatever. And now, now we're just in the house and uh, we're to a point now where the woman who found Bin Laden, and she was dope as shit, she didn't. She said, look, I don't know what it looks like inside the house, and I, I know you don't want me to tell you what I think. You're going to get in there and figure it out. But there will be a stairwell, and it will go to the second floor, and on that stairwell, you will run into Khalid Bin Laden. Yeah, and that's his 20-year-old uh, son. 20-year-old son. Yeah. He will be there. He will be armed. And she was so cool, man. She's probably the coolest person I've ever met. She said, if you can ace him, you will get a shot at the big guy. Okay. Well, later on, a book came out by, well, the pen name was Mark Owen. Mm -hmm. No Easy Day, the first-hand yeah. account of the mission that killed Osama bin Laden. Mm -hmm. Later on, his name was actually released mm -hmm. as Matt Binasset. I don't want to, uh, I don't want to say his Bissonette. name. He, he didn't want his name out, so I'm not going to acknowledge okay. his well, name. Well, if you Google it, it comes out. Fair enough. Was this someone who was on the mission with you? Yeah. Okay. So, so that part is legit. Yeah. So... He did a 60 Minutes interview where he was disguised. It's a good disguise, too. Oh, yeah? It doesn't look anything like no, him? No, I was, I was like, who's that? <laughs> who's that fat dude that's saying he was on the mission? Okay, so he talked about how the situation went. Mm -hmm. So I believe he was in the, the helicopter that crashed? Yes. He comes out. They try to sledgehammer the door initially or get the door open, and then they start shooting through the door. That was in a different house. That was in a different house? That was in house? a guest house, yeah. The guy was in a guest house. I don't know where he oh, came up with this story. that was the guest house. He was in the guest house. Okay. They returned fire. Yeah. They eventually got through the door, and 
they saw a woman holding children in there. Okay. Uh, how many women and children were in this house total? I, don't know. I think there, there was, I mean, 25 plus. 25 in, plus in, people. A combination of two different, a couple different structures, yeah. Because it was multiple wives and a bunch of children, basically. Uh, yes. I wasn't in that house there. I don't know what happened there. I, I, know, I mean, I, I, I know the two guys who were involved. And the one guy who you don't know who he is, when his story comes out, you'll realize once again that Mark Owen's not telling the truth. Okay, because he also talked about when he when he got inside, he saw one of the couriers with a gun, and his the wife jumped in front of him. They said how the women in this house were very hostile, which was yeah, a little weird. Yeah, we, we I did see that in the house that I was in because when one of my guys killed, uh, I think it was a brar, uh, his wife jumped in front of him, and he she got killed also. And we even had that conversation outside. He he said, uh, "Here's how weird the rules of engagement," and I, we we follow them. But one of the guys said, I, I just shot the woman and, and, and she just jumped in front of him. Am I, going to be, am I going to be in trouble? I was like, dude, get that out of your head. Let's go kill bin Laden first. Then we'll worry about going to jail later. Okay. So bin Laden was on the third floor? Yeah, of the main house. This the was a different house. house. Mm-hmm. Got it. So you're going in to the area where bin Laden is. Yeah, I'm already in that house, yes. You're They're already doing in that the house. other thing over in the other house, yes. You walk into the room and Osama bin Laden's three-year-old son... Yeah, who's saying? Two-year-old, maybe. Two or three, yeah. Two or three-year-old. Mm-hmm. Baby. Yes. And one of his wives. Yeah, yeah. Um, Amal bin Laden, yes. Okay. And then you see bin Laden. No, I saw bin Laden. I saw bin Laden. Uh, I saw Amal and Osama bin Laden first. Uh, after I shot Osama bin Laden, then and I moved Amal, and then I saw his son standing there. So I didn't see his son at all. Because, I mean, even Amal being in front of Osama, he was he was 6'4", and she was like 5'2". That's an easy shot. Plus, I'm two feet away from him. And then I saw Hussein afterwards, yeah. When you first see Bin Laden, what do you think? Yeah, so when I, when, when I first saw him, the reason that I saw him was there was one guy in front of me going up the last set of stairs, and there was a curtain at the top of the stairs instead of a door, kind of like a shower curtain slash carpet. When he moved that, he jumped on people that he thought were suicide bombers, and just because of our tactics, he goes this way, I go that way, and that's when I saw Osama Bin Laden standing there. And uh, he was in front of Amal Bin Laden, and it was uh, taller than I thought, skinnier than I thought, and his, his beard was more gray than anything. And I recognize his nose. Like, I've seen this picture a thousand, a million times. Um, he's not surrendering. He's a threat. I mean, all that fast. I'm going to kill him. So I shot him twice when he was standing up, and then I put one more on him. And then I moved him all because I know eventually other seals. I was, the, I was the only guy in the room for a, a matter of seconds, and I know other seals are coming in. So as the good guys, I want to I get them out of the way. Even the thought with the kid was like, this, this poor kid's got nothing to do with this. Well, bin Laden is not armed in this room. Uh, I didn't know. I thought he had a suicide vest on, though. Okay. And we'll talk about this a little bit later. But you saw him, you took your shot. Mm -hmm. How many times did you shoot him? Three. Three times. Mm -hmm. In the face? Yep. All three times? Yes. Now, quote unquote, Mark Owen said that he went into the room and he shot him as well. I have no idea where he got that story. So that's not true? No. I think he wanted to put himself in history. Like that's why he wrote the first book without approval. And then he got sued by the government. Okay, so were you the only person that actually shot Bin Laden? I don't know. I was the, I, I'm the definitely the guy that killed him. Uh, I don't know. I'd have to see the autopsy report. And if, if someone else came in the room and shot him, I don't care. Whatever. I killed him. I, I didn't. I didn't shoot him when he was dead. I just killed him. I mean, were other people coming in and taking shots possibly, at him? Possibly. We had a lot going on at that point. Okay. You have to see the autopsy. If they've released the pictures of the autopsy, that's the only way to say for certain. Okay, you kill Bin Laden. You take his baby and you put Move him on the, the bed, bed. Yeah. with the mother. Is the mother screaming and freaking out? Uh, not as much as she should be. And generally in a position like that, which we've seen hundreds of times, the initial shock, um, they're quiet. And then once they start to realize what's happening, then they start to make noise. They eventually did start crying. I mean, I remember some of his daughters were there too. And there was women and children downstairs that were upset. Okay. And Mark... The, the, you know, the, the pen name Mark, he claims he took the picture of Bin Laden. I don't know. You don't know about that. Okay. But he could have. I mean, the guy was on the mission and I worked with him for like 10 years. So it's like right. he, he was there. So now Bin Laden's dead, but his head was split from ear to ear. Yeah, it was, it was messed up. Yeah. Okay. You had to reassemble his face? Uh, I just held it together for one of the pictures we took. Yeah. That, I mean, that was me. So you're and, taking peacher, you know, yeah, I mean, I'm holding pieces his, of face and brain and yeah. nose and eyeballs. Pouring and, water on it and then putting it together. If the pictures are released, which I they should, 
Uh, those are my gloves. I still have these gloves. Like you can tell that that's my hands there. I mean, it's not, and this is not like an enjoyable thing to do. Um, it's 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 uh, it's a lot. Has to be done though. Yeah. Oh, no doubt about it. I mean, it's, it's not like it bothers me. That I have no problem with that. I mean, at the point that Bin Laden gets killed, how many more people get killed in that house after Bin Laden? Well, around the same time. Uh, there was two downstairs, Khalid on the stairs, Bin Laden upstairs, and then a bro- uh, the other guy. It was either one of the brothers in the guest house. He got killed. And the, so the the wife and the brother, the son, Osama, and somehow Amal got shot in the leg before I got there. And then um, the one guy in the guest house. So like five people get killed? No. Um, four one, people? One, two, three, four. Yeah, five people were killed when Amal Bin Laden was shot in the leg by somebody. Okay. <sighs> Now you guys go through and start grabbing hard drives and yeah, evidence. That was on the second like floor, and we didn't really realize that he was running the whole show for Al Qaeda from that house. But when we saw that, it's like because we wanted 32 minutes on the ground, but we stayed just because we're getting so much stuff, and all we're doing is looking for stuff that's important. Like if you run into a uh, an old school tower for a computer, you bust that, pull the hard drive, throw it in the back, and we're trying to label stuff the right direction. So when we get back, this is from this house on this floor in this room. So we're grabbing stuff, and it got to the point. So we're there 47 minutes before we left. But I remember running around saying, "Guys, we got to go. Like now is time to go. We got enough." Right. Let's it, leave. it was a 32 minute mission. 32 that, it ended up 47 minutes. Yeah, right. It went over. Mm-hmm. Okay, and you guys also find opium. In yeah, the house. I thought it was uh, ribeye steaks that were vacuum sealed. I opened it, like the big kit bags, and I opened one. I'm like, "Shit, this is steak. They're in it for the long haul." And then you start looking, like this is straight up raw opium. Yeah, bunch. So was he drug dealing? I think they were funding a lot of their missions with drugs. Yeah. yeah. That's the only reason. I don't think he was using it. Right. I knew I wanted to take some, but no, I don't have time. Fuck right. And, and later on, the hard drives, they went through them. They found all types of interesting stuff. There was a bunch of porn. They were saying <laughs> there was porn, but I'm not convinced it wasn't encrypted with missions. You could send it oh, across the border. Oh, I see what you're border. saying. Yeah. Because what they would do is take stuff from pa- Pakistan. is the center of the world in that part of the, the center of the universe, that part of the world. So you bring stuff in, they would, they would sell bootleg movies and music and smokes. So maybe they're just yeah, some porn this guy's bringing over, but there's encrypted mis- Maybe. I don't know. Maybe he watched porn and was jerking off, too. He had three wives. I don't know. Well, on May 6th, Al-Qaeda confirmed the death of bin Laden yeah. uh, on a bunch of militant websites. Uh, they vowed to avenge his killing. Uh, other Pakistani military groups, uh, including the tariki i taliban Pakistan, also vowed retaliation against the U.S. Mm-hmm. And also against Pakistan for not preventing the operation. Um, but in the U.S., 90% of the people actually supported it. Uh, the United Nations supported it. NATO supported it. The European Union supported it. Most governments around the world supported it. Uh, but in Pakistan, two-thirds of the people condemned it. Um, there was certain organizations like Amnesty International who actually said he was unarmed and he should have been captured. All right. When you hear that, what do you think? I don't care. I don't care. People that say that have never faced adversity face to face ever. I don't. I really don't care. And a lot of those, the UN, they, I, they, they're the most worthless organization in the world. NATO was around. To, to, <laughs> I don't even want to get into that. No, no, no one, um, no international organization has the United States' best interest in mind. And I couldn't care less. And I've met a lot of these punk diplomats in these. Right. There's also controversy. Uh, controversy because there was no DNA evidence that got released or photos that yeah. got released. Um, there was also a bunch of uproar in Pakistan about how the defenses got breached. The fact that you guys got into the country yeah. and out without anything. Isn't that awesome that we've proven yeah. that? And how when, the Air we, Force failed to detect you guys yeah, in the country. When we find you, you can do nothing about it. We will come to you. Right. And ultimately, the Pakistani government demolished the entire compound in 2012. I know. They should have kept that open, man. That'd be a good tourist spot. Yeah. Good, get, get a little income. There have been a lot of conspiracy theories around this. There's always conspiracy theories. Uh, there, one of them is that there was a body double. Yeah, I've heard that before. And the way that I... Look, I shot a guy who was with Osama bin Laden's wife. Either way, he had it coming. Well, didn't Trump tweet at one point that yes. there was a body double with bin Laden? Yes. Well, because he didn't want to give Obama the credit for killing bin Laden? I know. And that's what's ridiculous about and With Donald Trump being a New Yorker, you think he would just... And what he said, I know Donald Trump well. And he said, uh, I, I didn't I didn't endorse it. I just retweeted it. It's like, yeah, you're the president, though. And that's kind of yeah, an endorsement. Yeah, you're co-signing so. it. Yeah, I mean, it, what is it? He, want, he doesn't want President Obama to have... Look, I disagree with President Obama on uh, a lot of policies, but the guy's a gangster when it comes down to that stuff. 
Well, yeah, you actually responded to Trump. You said it was not a body double. Thank you, Mr. President. Yeah, I was thanking Barack Obama. Barack Obama. <laughs> and again, tongue in cheek. I mean, I'm not always serious on X. What was your favorite movie about this operation? Zero Dark Thirty or the SEAL Team 6 movie on Netflix? I, I don't think I've seen the SEAL Team 6 movie. Zero Dark Thirty was excellent, I, uh, except the ending. But that whole movie was really good. What an Oscar. Yeah, it should have. And Jessica Chastain crushed it. The only thing at the end is when they, uh, when she finally saw Bin Laden's body and they like unzipped the body bag and they left her alone and she cried. That's not what happened at all. She, we walked her over to his body and kind of sort of the, um, I, I gave her the magazine out of my gun. The point man who was in front of me actually said, well, you got to give her something because you, you killed him. And um, I pulled the magazine out, uh, the, the magazine out, pulled the last round out and I gave it to her. And then we walked, I said, you know, like, you have room for this in your backpack? And she said, yeah. And we walked o- her over to the body. And as we're walking over, it's like, man, this is historic. Like, this is going to be in the books. And sh- we're only here because she found him. And she gave up her life to find him. Like, she did not marry, no kids. She's working 20-hour days, seven days a week for years. And as I'm thinking all this, it's like, oh, shit, I'm the guy to kill him. I got to think of something cool to say, right? So we walked over to Bin Laden's body, and this was would have been cool enough. I pointed down to him, and I said, is that your guy? She looked down for a second and went, huh, I guess I'm out of a fucking job, and left. <laughs> okay. That's a true story. After the Bin Laden mission, you did one more deployment yes. in Afghanistan. Mm-hmm. And then was that pretty much it for you? Well, I was going to get out. My end of obligated service was January of 2012. That's when I was going to get out. Um, and then in uh, August, uh, Extortion 17 was shot down. We lost 31 Americans and a lot of guys from SEAL Team 6. And they, they lost an entire troop of like a thousand years worth of combat experience. And, um, I, you know, it's like I, I – because uh, there's some – it was a – that mission was a weird split with the uh, – whatever. And I'm like, you know what? I can go back. I can be a team leader for another squadron, help them backfill, and then I'll extend till August and get out. And the whole reason I did that is I wanted to help the team, help the mission, but also I wanted to let them know that uh, I came here through the front door. I'm leaving through the front door. And and there was all these rumors about, hey, O'Neill's writing a book, blah, blah, blah. I, I wasn't writing a book. The other guy was. Well, during the time that you served, you got two silver stars, yes. four bronze star medals, one joint service uh, commendation medal. Yeah, with Valor. Three with Valor, sorry. All those bronze stars, too. Three presidential unit citations, mm-hmm. two Navy, Marine Corps uh, commendation, commendation medals, and you got to senior chief petty officer. Yes. But during the time that you were with the Navy SEALs, you earned about 60000 a year. Uh, probably, yeah. 60 to 70 about, yeah. You would think you'd get a little more than that for the, I would the think kind so. of work that you put in. Well, I, you know, they spend so much money training us, too, and... They do, considering you're in the military, they pay us well based on um, dive pay, jump pay, hazard pay, save pay. Uh, you get extra pay, and everyone else is kind of making the same, so you don't realize that uh, that you are worth more. Because you're, you're with your friends, you believe in the mission, uh, and, and the camaraderie is incredible. I get a skydive for free. Um, you know, it's, 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 you know yeah. we used to fly in some private jets. It was kind of dope. Yeah, I would add a zero. But then, but then you get, you get out, though, and realize <laughs> there's, there's more money out there than just that. Well, you said you got a lot of hate and animosity in the military. I do? Well, you said you did at the time. Um, no, not really. No, there was, there was uh, because the name SEAL Team 6 came out, there was a lot of, there's a lot of guys out there that never want to be known for anything they've done, and they want to move back to the state where they came and raise their family in peace. Um, and the, the animosity just kind of, it, it went from, these badass warriors now all of a sudden they're being shown in front of people about the mission and they read the mission they give us the medals they weren't comfortable with that and just it, it was a weird time well 2012 and i mentioned this before yep. mark owen not his real name released the book no easy day the first hand account of the mission that killed osama mm-hmm. bin laden uh he did a 60 minutes interview in disguise yes. they changed his voice as well he claimed he was the second person in the bedroom uh, he claimed that he was one of the Navy SEALs that shot Bin Laden. He, he also said that he took the photo. He said he got injured, uh, not by, by gunfire, but shrapnel hit him like somewhere in the shoulder. So he ended up getting a Purple Heart. Yeah, the only Purple Heart on the mission. Yeah, pretty convenient, the only Purple Heart. And then you write an illegal book. So did he get a Purple Heart? Yeah, put himself in for it. Did anyone else get a Purple as Heart? As far as I know, at our first debrief around Bin Laden's body with McRaven, everyone's here, no one's hurt, here's Bin Laden. This guy killed him. That That's what went down. I don't know. You'd have to ask him these questions, man. I don't know what. Have you ever had a conversation with him after? Uh, I did a little bit when he asked me um, 
He asked me what happened in the room when I killed Bin Laden, and I sent him an email. I have to find it. I told him what happened in there. He wasn't, he, he, I don't know where he, I look, the guy's a great operator. I don't know what he came up with. Well, you had an interview in 2013 in Esquire. It was an anonymous interview mm -hmm. uh, where you talked about killing Osama mm -hmm. Bin Laden. So then... In late 2014, your name was leaked by other uh, former Special Forces uh, personnel who were protesting his violation of a code of silence that forbids them from publicly taking credit for their actions. My violation? Yes. Yeah, cool. I just show me that code of silence and where I signed, and I will agree with you. There is no. Is code there of a code of silence? No. No. I mean, the stuff I'm not allowed to talk about, I don't talk about. Like, it's it's not even really that interesting. Well, what are you not allowed to talk about? I can't about? tell you what I'm not allowed to talk about. Okay. Uh, it's, but it's like it's. But are you allowed to talk about killing Bin Laden? Sure. Yeah, I got approved. I did everything. Well, well what did what did Matt? Oh, I'm sorry, Mark Owen. What did he get sued for in terms of his? Because he got New York attorneys that told him to write a book to make a bunch of money, which he did. The Pentagon found out about it, said it's a bullshit script, and I think what they said is all you got to do is apologize, and he wouldn't apologize. So I'm like, again, you have to ask him. I wasn't involved. Right. But after your name was revealed mm -hmm. as the shooter of bin Laden, Mark Owen actually claimed that an unnamed point man fired the killing shots and said that it wasn't you. You know about uh, this, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, fine. I mean, you, you'd have to ask him. He wasn't there. He didn't see that part. I mean, someone better, if he's in the guest house and then he's also the two man in the main house, someone better call Usain Bolt and say, you're no longer the fastest man in the world. There's no fucking way he got that that fast. He, he made it up. I don't know why. I, I mean, I don't, I don't know if we went nuts. I don't know if we went crazy after all the PTSD. I don't know. He got sued. $7 million, something like that. Like, he, he wrote an illegal book based on bullshit. I, I can't, I can't, I, I don't know. I really, I don't know. And I don't like trashing other guys. I, I just, I don't know why he did it. Right, because there was a, a, publication, a publication called The Intercept. Yeah. They did a whole thing. Um, they've, been, the, they've been digging for war crimes since day one. Right. So according to the Intercept's interview of former SEAL Team 6 members, um, when O'Neill arrived, when you arrived, they say Bin Laden was already bleeding out on the floor and possibly already dead after being shot in the chest and leg by the lead assaulter which, which, of the uh, raid. Which former operators was that? They didn't say. So my name's Rob O'Neill. I'm at SEAL Team 6. I'm telling you what happened. These are disgruntled guys that weren't even good enough to get picked I'm, I'm for the mission. I'm not saying it's true. I'm just saying that I'm this just, is the controversy I, well, around yeah, it. Yeah, because they're pissed off probably drinking and some reporter asked them questions. I and according to another SEAL member, uh, they say that you merely walked over to the mobile uh, bin Laden and shot him twice in the head. And so, people that weren't even there said that. Right. Yeah. And uh, the Intercept also claimed that both you and uh, Mark... Uh, you know, there are multiple self-serving falsehoods in the way you guys both describe it. So just, they're, they're saying that everyone is not quite telling the truth. I'm just saying, I'm just telling you what happened. I'm telling you what I saw. I'm telling you what went down. I mean, you know, I would ask them, how did them all get shot? Who shot them all? I don't know. Yeah. She was shot. It wasn't me. He was standing when I saw him. I shot him three times in the face. It's like, this is what happened. And again, I'm not even, I don't even care about justifying it. I'm just telling you what happened. And if someone else has something different, especially an unnamed source, you got to ask them. Well, a former a commander of SEAL Team 6. Oh, a commander. So it means he's never been in a gunfight, an officer. Gotcha. Right. Uh, he said in an interview in 2014 that Robert had not played a singular role on either mission. And also said that O'Neill's specific role on any of these missions is relevant because Everything we do is as a team. That's, I've said that since day one also. I'm just telling you my, what I, I, I did nothing on that mission until the very end. That's it. Right. There's also a podcast called the Antihero Podcast. They did a whole thing on you claiming there's a bunch of inconsistencies in they, your stories. Oh, they're, they're trying to get famous by bad-mouthing people who actually went to war. Yeah. They, I'm not Listen, the only one. I'm not the one that's questioning you. I'm just telling I'm not, you, I'm not upset if you throw it. out a big story like this... You, there's well, going to be distract, you know, detractors. There's going to be people. You realize right now, I could tweet that I love French toast, and someone would say "fuck for you" and "fuck French toast." Right. Welcome to social media. I, I don't. It doesn't bother me. I'm, I'm legit. I don't have a problem uh -huh. because the truth never changes, and my story hasn't either. And if no one believes me, I don't give a shit. If some retired commander doesn't like me, he can literally go fuck himself. I don't care. I mean, is there some sort of code? Between I think I read know, about it in Navy the military history about section. not saying who the shooter was or saying who fired the shot or anything else like that. Is that a thing at all? Or I don't not? think so. I mean, you know how many guys got into the Navy because they read books written by warriors from Vietnam. Mm, true. And I'm happy that George Washington had a biographer with him, so I know what happened. 
and whatever. It's like, I don't, I don't care. I'm just telling what happened. You don't believe it. I don't care. I'm not you. I'm saying if someone doesn't believe yeah. it, fine. And if people on the mission don't believe it, fine. And if anti-hero, well, I don't care. I, well, I, like, I responded to them just because it was like amusing. I had a tweet at them like, you guys don't even know me. What, who are you? Well, you're seen as a hero to Americans, but to people who were supporters of bin Laden, supporters of al-Qaeda and Hezbollah mm -hmm. and Hamas, you're seen as a villain. Yeah. And there's actually a hit on your life? Yeah. I mean, that's why I'm so passionate about the election, because I don't want open borders, because I know what's coming. I'm okay. prepared for them. I know who they are, and I've dealt with them before. Do you know if there's actually money on your head? No, I don't know. Okay. They're going to Any it, attempts though. of any sort? No, not yet. But I mean, they got to be right once, and it happens really fast. Okay. Is there a level of paranoia? Yes. Not paranoia, but it's. I would. It, it would be a lot easier to be one of the dudes I went to high school with who's sitting at home right now with not a lot of worries. I mean, I'm prepared for it. I have... I have security in place. I have a lot of guns and knives and shit. So Yeah. Now, you can't get life insurance yeah. because ISIS. of the price on your head? Yeah. Because of ISIS. Yeah, I love those American companies too, man. We support the troops. Yeah, but do you? I need life insurance. You won't cover me. Yeah. But how do they prove there's actually money in your head? Well, I mean, they can look it up. There was that uh, English chick that was a bride of ISIS that was yapping at me all the time. They've, they've rolled up some dudes before the FBI has that were looking for me. <sighs> I fought these guys before. I'm not afraid of them. Well, right now you have Israel and Hamas yes. happening. Uh, and the Israelis actually killed the Hamas leader, uh, Yahya Sinwar. They did. In recently. Gaza. Yeah. Yeah, a couple of days ago. Mm -hmm. I had uh, Mike Rapport on my show and he yeah. was he, jumping up and down. He's been really good about that too. Like he, yeah, I, I like He's him. going hard. Yeah. Do you think that there's a, a solution? To this, uh, to this you know, war yeah, right now. Yeah, there, there is. And to broad brush it, uh, and this includes all of us, is education. Um, people are not born racist. They are not born hating. They are taught that. And uh, uh, like it or not, a lot of places in, in the West Bank, in Gaza Strip, and up in Lebanon, they've got this version of Sesame Street. Instead of teaching you letters, they teach you beheading the infidels. They're teaching, like, you can't raise kids this way. And then all of a sudden they turn 25 years old. Now, oh, I don't believe in it. Like, it's the same thing with the crap that we indoctrinated our kids in public school here with. You, you feed them bullshit enough, they're going to believe it. So the, the madrasas in, in Pakistan and the play, I mean, even over here, we, we, we really need to, like, I, it's a big planet. It's a small world. And the, the loudest boos come from the cheapest seats. So not everyone's an asshole, but for some reason, the assholes are in charge. And we listen. Education, man, um, it, if, you just, if you don't teach hate, this goes away. And you can't, I mean, and I've learned too. Like, like I said, I wanted to go to Iraq and Afghanistan, but I did learn also, regardless of your intentions, if you go there, you will be an invader. They're not going to like you. Like if Canada rescued us, but they have their troops in the streets here, I might fight them. And that's that's the education. You got to. Yeah. I mean, because you follow the money. Look at the top, used to be the top three Hamas leaders, all billionaires. That's UN humanitarian aid coming from the United States, Israel, and the UK. None of it goes to the Palestinians. It all goes to Qatar, where the leaders are. They're billionaires. They're poor. Th th that's the problem. And they, as long as they keep this ideology up, they can stay in power. Follow the power. Follow the money. And that's that's what they're doing. Keep the people enslaved. Keep them just poor enough so they don't revolt. They elect Hamas. Well, yeah. After uh, Yaya Sinwar was killed, there was a photo that was released of his wife going through one of the tunnels, and she has a thirty-two thousand dollar Birkin bag in her hand. Mm -hmm. So to think, and this is the guy who architected the October seventh attack. Yes. So to think that here is a country, well, a region that was blockaded by the Israelis and. The people are starving, and mm -hmm. that's what's causing a lot of the the of anger and so forth. And look, I'm Jewish myself, but I've publicly said on multiple platforms, including the Breakfast Club, that I feel that both both parties are at fault. You know, the October seventh and Hamas. You know, that's horrific, but also the way Netanyahu responded with the the mass bombings, with so many civilians and kids and women getting killed. I don't support that either. Uh, that's my point of view, yeah. but. Seeing the leader of Hamas, his wife with a Birkin bag was a, was a you know, you kind of roll your eyes a little bit saying like, you got a group of people who are starving, who are getting more mm -hmm. and more angry and your wife has a Birkin bag. Yeah. Like, 
clearly we see that the money is being funneled, you know, yeah. disproportionately to certain people. And if you if you keep your people oppressed which makes the international community want to give more money, but you keep the money. You can keep them oppressed. The money keeps coming into you. Yeah. That's all they're doing here, too. And, I mean, having been to war a bunch, I wish there was no war. I hate seeing kids get hurt. It's it's That will mess with you more than anything. So the bombing, it sucks. However, cr- putting your headquarters and weapons depots underneath hospitals and schools is a war crime, and that's what Hamas is doing. And, unfortunately, that's the Israel tells people, leave now, we're bombing. Uh, that's the best they can do. You need you need to kill the cockroach, man. You, what's George Carlin's um, joke about? Uh, if the government was in charge of, of inventing a roach spray, they wouldn't invent a roach spray that kills a roach. They would spend billions of dollars, though, creating a roach spray that fills the roach with self doubt of whether or not it's in the right house. You step on them, right. and you ha- look. You have to you have to decapitate Hamas. There is Hamas right now. The the West Bank. And the Gaza, well, the Gaza Strip especially, could be a beautiful resort area making trillions on, but they can't because they can't get over whatever they're pissed about. Well, look, 1,700 Israelis were killed and 41,000 Palestinians. Now, yes, yeah, some of them are Hamas, but there's also a lot of non combatants There's a that. lot of blame on that, not just the bomb. Stop electing Hamas, too. No, I, I understand that. And as someone who's been in actual warfare in the Middle East— when you have a group like Hamas who is blending in and hiding behind civilians and children and so forth, is there a way of eliminating Hamas without so many civilian yeah, casualties? Yeah, and that, again, that comes with the education, and then it's got to be from within. The same thing in Iran. Like, the Iranian people are awesome. It's the it's the leadership and the clerics that suck. Right, well, according to Eric Prince, Iran has been funding all this stuff. Iran is, but not the people. Right. So you, the leadership— Yeah, look, Gaza— Iraq, Al Qaeda, a lot of this is coming from Iranian money. Uh, most of it is, yeah. Most of it but, is. But I mean, where's the Iranian money coming from? We lift the sanctions; they're selling their oil to China. Right. Uh, we send them pallets of billions of euros. Uh, we're funding them. You think Iran's giving it to their people? No, they're funding terrorists. You got to get rid of the leadership. We've proven before we can't go in as Americans or as a coalition and insert Jeffersonian democracy. The people need to do it, but we need to back them up. We can't do the shit that we do where there's an uprising because the Iranians killed a woman for not wearing, you know, showing too much hair. Then they uprise with our back. Then our media shuts them out. We don't know. Then they start executing people. You, they need a coup, not like the one we had this summer. They need a real coup to get rid of them and the, the people need to rise up. You can't. The, the animals are in charge. They're not gonna. They're not gonna change. Well, listen, it's sad. Uh, oh, I'm so Jewish. it's completely sad. It sucks. Uh, listen, I'm, I'm Jewish. I've been to Israel about three times. I've also been to Palestine. I've met with Palestinian families. You know, I have very close uh, Muslim friends. My entire life, Israel and Palestine has been at war. Mm-hmm. You know, you go to Tel Aviv. You know, you go into a shopping mall, and there's someone checking for bombs at the front door. Like it's not. It's not a pleasant way to live. No. And the people are the ones who are all hurting. Every single person in Israel has to join the military when they turn 18. Yes. And a a lot of them end up dying, you know, through warfare. It's been happening forever. And you you have a very ugly situation because Hamas does not want to actually talk directly with Israel because they don't respect them as an actual country. They treat them as occupiers in the whole river to the sea. Right. They want them wiped out. Mm -hmm. Um, And if you've been to Israel, have you been to Israel? I've been past it. I've never been into it. If you go to Israel, you realize Israel looks just like California. (laughs) It looks just like Arizona. It looks like a first world country with fast internet, high rise buildings, Mm -hmm. great roads. You go over the border to Egypt and you see a very different situation. So to think that you're going to wipe out Israel and displace the people, it's simply not going to happen. It's it's a multi, multi, multi-billion dollar economy. So this whole concept of we're going to wipe them out and take our land back, at some point you have to realize this is never going to happen. No, never. Never. It's never going to happen. But see, I'm- I know everyone wants to do the free Palestine thing and, you know, get rid of the Jews. It's not going to happen. Israel is here to stay whether you like it or not. It's been too long and it is what it is. So there has to be some sort of compromise. You would think. But what do you think the compromise could be? Education. I mean, if I, I mean, I mean, every so uh, uh, Jewish people, Palestinians, Christians, Muslims, they work in Israel where you can there's gay marriage and you can be transgender in Israel. They're kind of they're kind of with the current events here. Yeah. There's some assholes next door, and the people don't like them. They've got to figure it out. Like if they, if they, 
I, 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 I'm a bit, I really think that if, if the Palestinians threw their weapons in the Mediterranean, there'd be peace. If the Israelis did it, there'd be genocide. Right. It kind of tells you where it's at. And you don't need to convince me that Israel's there to stay. I, I'm on board with that. I wish, look, the, if they would stop killing each other, I'm telling you, the economy would be better in both cities, but they, they, in both states. They just, they've been trying this shit forever. And it's just, it's not working. And I'm, I, you know, it, each side's going to argue for each side, but I, I think if they just stopped with the terrorist shit, it would be fine. I really do. Listen, I, I agree. And I remember I interviewed uh, Maris Yahoo. He's a Jewish reggae artist. Yeah, oh, yeah, cool. Yeah, used to be He's Hasid. awesome. Yeah, he used to be, uh, yeah, he was just here uh, about a week ago. I'm starstruck right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, he used to be a uh, Hasidic Jew. You know, he shaved yeah. off his yeah, beard yeah. and so forth. And what he said was very interesting at the end of our interview. He talked about how to outsiders like Americans, to college students, Hamas looks sexy and dark and they're freedom fighters and they're going up against the man and so forth. But really, these guys are kidnapping children. Mm -hmm. They're... Open, you know, they're opening fire at music festivals. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you see what I'm saying? They're launching thousands and thousands of missiles, which every missile could take out thousands of people. Mm -hmm. You know, luckily there's an iron dome and so forth to protect it. But it's very ugly, you know. And honestly, like I said, I'm not a fan of Netanyahu also. Like, I feel that Netanyahu could have handled things differently. And a lot of the... Because of all the casualties that are happening from the mass bombings, you're getting a lot of anti-Semitism and you're having yes. a lot of people that are turning against Israel. Yes. You know, Israel may be the reason why one president wins the election and one does not. Think about that. You know, based on the right. stances of both presidents and how, how much of a trigger issue this is, this may affect who the next president of the United States is. It could. I mean, it should, too. I, what Israel's doing right now, the hard truth is they're showing us how to win a war. So you support Israel? Yes. And again, with with the Palestinians, man, I I hate to see innocent people get hurt. Yeah, me let too. Let alone killed or and be, being bombed. I I couldn't imagine what's like being in a building that gets bombed. It's it's horrible, a hor horrifying and horrible. Yeah, uh, horrible is a word I just apparently made up. But um, yeah, I, I if I could stop it, I would. Uh, it's it's uh, I mean, there's, you know, there's been war over religions as, as long as there's been religion. Yeah, I mean, and that's and that's the problem because you're dealing with God. You're also dealing with the old city of Jerusalem, which is a very important place. Oh, yeah. Historically. For everybody. You see what I'm saying? And mm -hmm. once again, a lot of the people who have these strong opinions have never actually been to Israel. They don't realize that Jerusalem is split into a Jewish, a Jewish section and a Muslim section. And, you know, like the Rock of Life, which is extremely, an extremely holy place. They say that that's where God created the earth, you know, this one rock. And this is where a lot of Muslims go to pray. Jews are not allowed there. There's also See, the, that's kind the, of that's one thing there too. I mean, well, there's the Wailing Wall, and Muslims aren't really allowed there. And it's it's a place where if you're extremely religious, you don't want to compromise and say, okay, I'm going to let the other side yeah, happen. Yeah, yeah, I got it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this is the problem. Once you bring God and the afterlife it's into the bring, equation, it's hard to really the, have the a problem, reasonable conversation. Is, it's not bringing God into it. It's bringing man's interpretation of God into it. Well, so, I mean, is exactly. it possible that God is so great that it, we could all be wrong and right? Right. Well, listen, I'm, I'm not religious. At the end of the day, and being in Israel, when you talk to the young people there, they're tired of it also. Yeah, I think a lot of They don't of want to keep living like this generation after generation. And in fact, at one point... Things were looking a lot better. Remember when Rabin and yeah. Arafat actually yeah. shook hands and there was that, yeah, the whole Camp David mm -hmm. situation. Yeah. And then Rabin gets killed by a Jewish guy. And then that stopped the whole peace process. You know, and that's what I learned when I was in Israel is that terrorism is designed to stop the peace process. Totally. Things start to get worked out, people start to make compromises. But a hardline group says, we don't like these compromises. We want it from the river to the sea. Mm -hmm. So thing, you know yeah. what we're going to do? We're going to blow up a school bus. Yeah. They blow up a school bus. And then the other side says, these people are animals. You can't, you can't compromise with them. Look, they just blew up a bunch of children and old men and old ladies. So the peace process stops. In order to actually have the peace process, you have to ignore the terrorism. But that's hard to do. Yes. And it hasn't worked historically. Well, you're not getting rid of the terrorists. You're not getting rid of the terrorists. And I mean, the problem too, the, the, the same, the other side of the coin, when you go into a place that is innocent and say you kill someone you think is a terrorist, but he wasn't, now you just created more terrorists. Exactly. I mean, it's, it's I, I, again, I, I wish it could stop, but unfortunately, we get, you know, men are involved, so it's not going to stop. 
Do you expect more terrorist attacks in the U.S.? No, 100%. Soon. Soon. It's very soon. On it's the not level be of 9-11? Way different. Probably worse. I think what's going to happen will be um, gun-free zones, probably in blue states. Uh, something gun free. What you can't have a gun? No, I'm talking like they'll hit an elementary school like they did in Beslan in Russia. Oh, okay, got they'll it. Across the southern border because it's wide open, which they're already here. When they uh, when they activate their sleeper cells, who were already here, I'm talking Grand Central Station, elementary school in Arizona, um, a- anything you can imagine, Times Square. Um, yeah, it's. I mean, uh, uh, everything from EMP to to shutting, blowing up bridges, uh, infrastructure. Shut down uh, anything. I mean, imagine if everything just shuts off. Do you think there's a bigger threat from Islamic terrorists doing things in the U.S. or homegrown terrorists like a Timothy McVeigh? I think uh, the jihadis. I don't think there's. I don't think the homegrown terrorists are as bad as uh, a lot. Of, a lot of the media tries to spin up to be yeah. even. Keel. Timothy McVeigh was pretty horrific. Oh, what he what he did was bad. I mean, I don't. I know that the Oklahoma City bombing was horrible. I don't know how it happened. I don't know. I, I don't even know. I mean, I'm at the point now where I'll believe or disbelieve anything. So yeah, it was him. And yeah, he got executed. I, I I'm not well read. Are enough you on, saying he didn't do that? I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying I'm not well read enough to. Uh, he had a whole van I'm also full saying of it's, fertilizer I mean, that he detonated right next to the right, building. Right. Yeah. But and and like Jack Ruby killed Lee Harvey Oswald, who was saying he was a pat. I didn't do anything. Boom. He's dead. Oh, look at that. Case closed. Well, Timothy McVeigh, some really well, bad Timothy McVeigh was alive for a long time before yeah, he was well, executed. I, you know what? Like I said, didn't study it. Don't know. Okay. I'll go with the narrative. Okay, fair bad enough. Guy. Uh, but we haven't seen a lot of homegrown terrorism. We well, see a lot of shootings. Yeah, they're everywhere. Yeah. Which That's you don't see in other countries. Yeah, okay. Church got, shootings, school shootings. Yeah, I mean, shootings. It's, it's pretty messed up. Again, education. These are bad people. Yeah. You don't, you don't, you don't, if, if I took a gun and loaded it and set it down here in 10,000 years, it wouldn't go off without me. As a former sniper, when you saw the whole Donald Trump shooting, mm-hmm. and we had Nicholas serving here, you know, Nicholas said that if that was him, he would have missed his target. No, he said it's not even that hard of a shot. It was 100, 100, 150 yards. yards. It's yeah. easy. You can pick up which nostril you want. Exactly. Simple. But of course, he said that the guy was probably very nervous. Yes. A cop had just gotten on the roof and so forth. Yeah. Could you have made that shot? Oh, yeah. I can do it right now. Easy. Easy. Simple. I could, I could teach a kid to do it. Give me five minutes, I'll teach him. Why do you think he missed? Uh, and just barely missed? Barely, well, because Trump moved. Um, and he didn't miss, he killed a guy. He hurt, critically wounded two other people. Uh, he, he missed because he'd moved. Uh, and uh, I don't know what kind of sights he was using. Was it iron sights he was using, maybe? Uh, easy, I mean, it's, you could hit it with a pistol. It's not a hard shot. And he shot like six times. Um, that, that's a shady incident, too, man. Why was... Why didn't anyone say, hey, there's a guy moving. There's a, go- there's a dude with a long gun. There's a guy ma- who's involved. Like that right there shows you the deep state because either the Secret Service was either in on it or they were incompetent. That's it. Right. Both I mean, because you've done security over the years, yeah. obviously. Mm-hmm. Did you see a total breakdown of security t- in that situation? Breakdown from the beginning. Huh. Everything from the people that were part of, the, um, part of the detail weren't even part of the detail. Some weren't even Secret Service. And then not talking to the local cops. What they have? They, they didn't even have uh, radios. They're like texting or whatever or calling. Um, the perimeter is the, 140 yards. You said he's outside of the perimeter. Have it to a minimum of 500 yards, usually 1,000. And that's a shot you can make also. Uh, it's just, a, it's a tough, it's a, it's, that, that's a, it's a, it's a breakdown. It's, it's uh, everything from, well, I mean, even like a DEI hire, it's, it's, this is not hard that if the principal is 6'4", I don't want a five foot five woman there because she, he's taller. I want someone tall. And if it happens to be a six foot five woman, kick ass. But that's wrong. That's stupid. Yeah. That's, and stupidity will get you killed. So will complacency. That's all that's happening. Well, Robert O'Neill, man, appreciate you coming in. Thank you again for your service. Uh, Bin Laden has been the boogeyman for quite a while. And I remember after 9-11 happened, at the time I was living in California. People were upset, but then I remember a few weeks later I went to New York and I got to see really how people were upset. Mm -hmm. You know, that's when you really got to meet people who knew, who had friends in the Twin Towers, who would drive around and look at the buildings and they're no longer there. Yeah. And, and New Yorkers were really, really hurt, I, really upset. I love coming to New York. Of all of, of the the only place I think in the country that never forgets is right here in New York. Exactly. Yeah, so, I, 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 yeah I, I, I'm agreeing with you. Yeah, you, you have to really understand how deep this went 
for, you know, in the city where this actually happened, where thousands of people died, mm -hmm. plus the firefighters, plus all the after effects. People still dying. People still dying mm -hmm. from this, you know. And it really looked like for a long time that bin Laden was going to get away with it and just die of old age. We were joking about it, knowing that, the, and I'm talking weeks before, like knowing we're never going to find the guy. I would joke with people I was interrogating. Uh, no shit. Like be interrogating dudes, blah, blah, blah. Who's this, blah, blah. Where's bin Laden? And like we'd both go, I don't, like both of us, like that's a funny joke. No one's ever going to find this dude. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, knowing what you know now, do you think that Bin Laden could have gotten away with it? Was there certain moves that he made that he could have avoided where he would never would have been detected? No. Um, our Again, I wasn't I wasn't one of the smart people that found him, but they were good enough to lull him into counterintelligence is false sense of security. The bullshit with the, uh, the dialysis machine and living in a cave, that was all bullshit. Right, yeah, because they were saying that he was dying and he was on dialysis. And you know and... why they said that? Because when someone comes up to you to get money for, I, I saw him, definitely him, saw the dialysis. Like, well, no, you didn't because he doesn't have them because I made that up. So they're smart enough to lull yeah. him into that. So he was he was hiding in plain sight and he got complacent. Like I just said, complacency kills. Well, you think the Pakistani government knew about him? The intelligence him? service did, yes. And they hit him? Yeah. Well, it's in their best interest because... They, they're a nuclear power. They don't want Al-Qaeda necessarily just striking them and if they get nukes. So they're going to play, and every ally does it. We're going to be an ally to a point, but we're number one. We, we are self-interest. So they, yeah, they, definitely they knew about it. They, you know, they're, they're trying to get on with what they're doing too. Well, final question. Do you think that killing bin Laden actually changed anything? I do just because of the healing process with a lot of people who were affected by 9-11 with the closure. Uh, not even closure, just healing, um, and then being a, I mean, being able to say, yeah, we actually got them, and proving, like I said earlier, when we find you, we will come get you ourselves. Uh, that, so that was, that, that was, yeah, it was a great thing. And, if, and what I liked about it, too, was we had a Democrat in power, but there were also Republicans in, uh, in the cabinet. The Secretary of Defense was Republican. Just that none of it mattered at that point, that we did come together and didn't put, like, if we failed and got killed, Barack Obama's not winning his next election. So he made a non-political decision on what's best for everybody. And we all came together. And it was, I mean, and you said, you called me a hero. The heroes were the pilots. <laughs> I'm the sledgehammer carrier. Mm. That's just what I do. The pilots got us there. And is Al-Qaeda still around? Oh, yeah. Al-Qaeda Al is dangerous because uh, like ISIS likes to show you what they're doing. Uh, Al-Qaeda will stab you in the back. They will be very quiet and then will destroy you. So yeah, they're around. I mean, again, can't get complacent. Yeah. Well, again, Robert O'Neill, man, I appreciate you coming in Thanks, and sharing Brian. your stories. It's historic. This is something that will be told for many generations after we're gone. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, you know, you're right. It really sends a message. It, you know, you could do these terrorist attacks, but you will probably mm -hmm. be killed. Yeah. You know, and this is what's happening in Hamas, where you're constantly seeing these Hamas leaders yep. getting killed over and over again. And there is a deterrent. You know, if you want to go and take on this role, and yeah. mastermind the killing of Americans or Israelis or whoever else, there is going to be a price on your head which will be carried out in a reasonable amount of time. Mm -hmm. And I think that, yes, you have people who don't care about dying and are waiting for their virgins in heaven and so forth. But I think most rational people don't want to be killed doing a job. Uh, that's what I would like to say, too. That's why I'm with the yeah. rational people in charge for a change. Exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Once again, thank you for coming Thanks, in. Wish you all the best. Thank you so much. Peace.